Hello and welcome back to episode three of the Boxing Social Podcast. I'm your host, Rob Tebbett. Coming up this week, we'll be looking forward to James the Gale's super middleweight clash with Chris Eubank Jr., as well as being joined by George Groves, Paulie Malinaji in this week's episode of The Ten Count, among other guests. Unfortunately, this week, it's just going to be myself, due to my co-host, the lovely Dave Allen, unfortunately not being here due to being in preparations for his fight with Lucas Brown. I'm as surprised as you are, but he is taking it very seriously. Um, before we get started, a few things that I'd like to uh, address at the start of the podcast. Um, a few things that I think need to be addressed and that I've grown weary of in recent months. Um, there are certain other outlets that we're constantly being compared to um, being quite a new company and the new kids on the block. Uh, starting to really get on my nerves, to be honest with you. There are certain other people out there who are, um, let's say, favoured in the industry, always getting the long sit downs, always getting the access, backstage, riding with Eddie Hearn in the car. To be honest, don't really think it's fair. Um, raw, uncut, yeah, original. But what can you do? Just have to keep plugging along, waiting in queues, looking at Coogan while he's interviewing Hearn. <laughs> what crisps you like, Eddie? <laughs> It's boxing talk, isn't it? But what can you do? You know, you carry on. You do what you can. can excuse me, mate. Do you mind? This, I'm trying to film a podcast here. What crisps do you like, Rob? Hello, mate. <laughs> How are you doing? All right? Yeah, not bad. My ears were burning oh. in Essex. Yeah. yeah. How are you? I'm all right. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit awkward, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, do we know that he's... He's here. Oh, we do. Uh, so, uh, seeing as you're here, you might as well. Um, I might as well join your podcast. Yeah, you might as well. You might as well hang around. Um, delighted to be joined this week by Mr. Coogan Cassius from IFL TV in association with MTK Global. Got that down to a T, haven't I? Well done. Absolutely brilliant. <laughs> How you doing, Coogs? What's going on behind us, by the way? I have no idea. There's it's something fine. going on. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. It's, it's very interesting. How are you? I'm very well, Robert. Um, did you have a cup for me with Lionel Richie or no? You've got water. Shirley Bassey. Oh, you've okay. got. You're actually in the gym and training. I'm. I'm definitely not. Fair enough. So um, no coffee for you. Do you want a coffee? Really good setup you have here. You like it? Hmm. Feeling it. Yeah. It's not bad. Well, delighted to be here. <laughs> a, a little bit unexpected, but delighted to be here. Yeah. I mean. Um, We've been trying to work on this for a while. I've been trying to entice Mr. Coogan Cassius onto the Boxing Social podcast um, for the last couple of episodes. So it's very, very pleasing for me that you've joined us. You know, have you ever heard the expression, uh, a drunk man speaks a sober man's mind? Yeah. Right. That's what I got from that little skit. <laughs> you know, when you were actually doing it, I was listening to it and I'm thinking, you bastard. <laughs> Like, is this actually what you think and this is your way of actually getting it out there? I could have said a lot worse. You could have said a lot worse. People do say a lot worse. They do, they do. And um, one of the reasons that I've been keen to get you on this week is, um, well, first and foremost, I've been a fan of your work for a long time, as you know. Um, one thing that people probably don't know who are watching this is we've become quite good mates recently, over recent times. I think um, LA was, was kind of a, a big deal for us our relationship if you want to call it that um wilder fury it was good to get to know you oh you're talking about me and you yeah oh well who do you think i was talking I mean, about you said relationship and <laughs> valentine's last night i was thinking what on earth are you talking about yeah no um no valentine's no. pleasure for me i actually spoke to chris eubank jr uh chris eubank senior yesterday um which was the second valentine's day in a row that i've spoken with him which is quite weird and romantic at the same time yeah something like that mm. um so Go on, this is your, your show, not mine. You've you've dragged me down here. You <laughs> crack on. You haven't dragged me down here at all. I uh, came here willingly. You did come here willingly. Um, money's in a bag outside. This week, myself and Mr. Coogan Cassius will be previewing James the Gale versus Chris Eubank Jr. as well as reacting to the news of George Groves' retirement. Uh, before we get started on that, I did just mention him at the start of the podcast. My mate and your mate, the incomparable Dave Allen, the white rhino, not here this week because he's deep in training for his fight with Lucas Brown. Um, you're somebody who's known Dave, obviously, a lot longer than me. Nice to see him actually 
taking training seriously for a little bit. Yeah, putting uh, other commitments aside and <laughs> focusing on his training. I mean, what are these boxers doing nowadays anyway? But uh, Wouldn't have him any other way though. Um, coming up first on the Boxing Social podcast, we will be, well, won't be joined. I actually had to go and see George Groves as he enjoys retirement, um, having enjoyed a stellar career, the former WBA super middleweight champion of the world. Check it out. This is Rob Tubbett for Boxing Social. Delighted to be joined here today by the Saint George Groves. Um, thanks very much for having me down to Casa del Groves. How are you, George? I'm good, thank you. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. You're welcome. Uh, yeah, it takes it takes a lot of me to leave the house these days, I suppose. So, uh, no, you're welcome to come in. Well, as I said, thanks very much. I uh, do appreciate you having me down. How's retirement treating you? Yeah, very good. Very good. I'm in, I'm enjoying myself. I. Uh, I try and nip down in the gym from time to time to um, curb the the damage that's being done, you know, in the fridge and the rest of it. But uh, yeah, and no, I've been enjoying some some family time, which is uh, you know usually uh, it's compensated obviously when you're in the gym. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm, there's definitely no 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 urges to get to to get back boxing anytime soon. So uh, no, I'm, I'm enjoying myself. I was just about to say you're missing it, but I've taken enough from that to know. Um, it's just something we just spoke about off camera. When you announced your retirement, I was very fortunate, privileged really, to come down to Wasserman and fortunate to grab a quick word with you. Was a quick word. 15 minutes, I think, is not really enough time to discuss your career. So let's do that today. Um, talk to me about the start, George. Growing up, pathway to boxing, as I understand, you kickbox beforehand. Just tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I think I was six or seven. When I first started, watched watched a couple of the Rocky movies and was was ready to go. Um, a bit too young to start boxing because I think Dale Youth, even like my local club, they said come in when you're ten. So uh, seven, I started kickboxing. Really enjoyed it, you know. Um, and it was a, uh, it was it was great fun. I mean, it was hard. It was really hard. I used to, they used to train me like an adult, which I think um, you sort of uh, you know they helped helped me along my journey. Sort of became that sort of. They taught me how to uh, give me that champion work ethic, you know, which I put it sort of, I tried to explain later on. But um, yeah, so so right up to the age of 13, I was, um, I was, I was kickboxing. Good fun. Um, learned a lot of life skills. Uh, got, uh, got my black belt in the end. Took a long time. I got my black belt and thought, I thought I was Prince Nassim Hamid at the time because I was boxing on all these sort of like um, full contact sort of shows. It was, it was, um, pretty niche but uh used to ring walk you know you had like ring card girls with this and i'm like eight years old you know fighting for belts um it was a bit of a come down when i actually started boxing and then like you just get in with your vest on and then well then you why don't you get a little trophy like that and away you go so um no, it was great fun it was a good experience you know that uh you know for, you know fighting in front of you know, really big crowds you know so uh all, all, my, all my friends and family used to come and watch even as a kid so it was good to build the fan base early on as well and it was uh it was yeah it was good very good i did sit down with your old amateur teammate and professional stable mate luke campbell a couple of weeks ago and he said that you were roommates um how was that i mean luke's uh now i've come to i don't know luke very well but i know him enough to know he's quite a quirky guy um <laughs> what was that like living with luke campbell uh so it started off at the very start um he was the smallest kid on the team. Like he was, um, I mean, he was stick thin back then. He's filled out a bit now. He's got, he's got, got some guns and that. But back then he was stick thin, and he kind of had little man syndrome. Do you know what I mean? He was sort of wandering around and he used to talk a good game. Was like, you know, um, but he was a good fighter. Like everyone else, he's a good fighter. You know, you gain the respect of everyone else. And um, that first year, um, I think him and Anthony Agogo won gold at the Junior Olympics, mm. which is funny because they both went on to the London Olympics and medal. So Luke won gold. Um, that was a funny old trip. We was in Texas. We stayed in a motel for like two weeks. We was going for runs down the back of this motel, down you know through wasteland, trying to dodge crocodiles and mosquitoes and everything else. Um, but come the end of that sort of that calendar year of the um, the, the tournaments, we ended up in. Russia for the European Championships and we all medalled. Um, Mia Gogo and uh, Campbell, we all ended up with bronze and uh, 
you know, it was it was sort of we were in, but it was we were the lads, and then us three got brought on the following year, and quite a lot of the lads didn't make it through. So it was um, it yeah, became really good mates, really really good mates. Um, he uh, he came down and stayed with me for a couple of weeks as an amateur. I think it was around time we were both in the ABAs, or maybe just before, because um, his gym was sort of shut for 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 a little while. So yeah, he lived with me. Uh, for only a couple of weeks, but it was good fun to put him down. Dale, so, so that's you know we've had two Olympic champions at that gym now. Cause I'm claiming uh you know, obviously uh, Campbell as well as uh James De Gale. but um just just a, just a lovely guy. I visited him um while he was uh during the London Olympics. They were staying in Stratford in one of the apartments. Went down there just to grab a coffee with him because he's from Hull. You know I hardly ever get got to saw him. And now it was great, you know. Um, obviously, I've I've sort of I'm not in the gym as much now, but um, to have him in training with Shane, um, sort of, I vouched for him with Shane. I sort of I vouched for Shane with Luke. I was like, he's a, he's a, he's a really good guy. He trains hard. He's you know, and he's a very talented fighter. Like um, likewise, I'm not. You know, I, I'm sure they made up their minds between each other anyway, but you know, I said like um, Shane's a good guy, you know. He's got he's, he got me over the line, you know, and that's a, there's a lot lot to be said about that. Um, good trainer, you'll get on just fine here, and uh, yeah, I think all boxers are quirky to a certain <laughs> extent, you know. He's a he's a, you know, plus they, f different people from different. Um, different parts of the country so like they're they're almost like a different culture you know um but for 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 a, a, a fellow northerner yorkshireman you know from Hull, he he uh he, fit, he fits in pretty well down 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 in uh down in london so he, he's doing all right now we've mentioned his name a couple of times already in this interview um so before we come on to your professional career james the gale um former amateur teammate and former professional opponent do you remember the first time you met james um, not not particular. I don't think it was I mean, I was I joined. I he was already there when I joined joined Dale, and I I didn't even know that until later on when someone had sort of pointed out he obviously started before me. Um, I was pretty really quiet. Sort of kept myself to myself. Had a couple of mates. We went. Um, yeah, I wasn't there that long. I think I was there a year and I went in the schoolboys, won the schoolboys and then went to Vegas and I know De Gale was there but he didn't get he didn't go to Vegas with us that year. So our amateur club used to team up with Finchley and some other like we they used to they used to try and pick a crop of good fighters, we'd take us all to the States and we would fight um sort of a London select versus Vegas select. It's fantastic. Do you know what I mean? And you're twelve years old and you're wandering up and down the you know, the Vegas strip. Um we used to fight in the first few years we boxed at the Texas station then we moved to the, the New Orleans and you know they said the atmosphere there was better than some of their pro shows because obviously lots of kids are out going out there fighting their parents come with them you know it's Vegas any excuse so you're going to have a nice time and it was real sort of like like a, a mini invasion you know so going out there so um, we, used to, we used to love that but um, James James was just a bit part player. He was he was in the gym, but he was very lazy. He wouldn't do the wouldn't train hard. You know, at the end of a session when you're a kid, you got to do your groundwork, which is like you know, twenty sit ups, twenty press ups. He wouldn't do it. You know, he wouldn't he couldn't do the runs. He was always he was chunky. He was a fat kid. You know, and then um, at some point, I think it was he was probably about fourteen, fifteen, maybe even older. He decided to sort of take it seriously. He lost some weight, and he started winning. He just literally overnight he went from orthodox to southpaw, found 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 his found his feet and uh yeah, started, started winning. Um got selected for England. Um went on a couple of trips, won won the ABAs at eighteen, which, you know, even back then it was pretty unheard of. The guys that were winning sort of the national championships were the, the old school guys who've been in it years and years and years. So for an eighteen year old he was usually too immature to go in. But they win it on skill, you know, because that's what that's what amateur boxing was really about. Um, it's only three rounds. Uh, yeah, he won, won two ABA titles. And uh, then it was my, I was 18. I wanted to go in the ABAs. Uh, so that's when we obviously clashed and, and fought and ain't got on since. So now it's gone. 
So was there no animosity before then? Was it only when you kind of saw each other as rivals, so to speak, that that this kind of I don't know, this beef, kind of the origin of that? Yeah, well, I always anticipated it, and I maybe he didn't. Maybe he just thought that you know I will bow down to him, you know, and and avoid him and whatnot. But I didn't really see him as much of a threat, you know. I always thought I'd be. I've always thought I was better than him, um, and I think. He thought it a bit ludicrous, like that, you know, I'd want to fight him or I want to go in the, the ABAs. Um, I thought it'd be ludicrous that I'd beat him, and, and obviously I did, and he couldn't, he generally couldn't take it from there. Um, I think it's in his nature to be patronising. You know, he used to patronise me, you know, when I was 16 and he was 18 and stuff like that. Um, but, you know, I was, I was ready to fight him. I, you know, I've watched him enough times. We've done enough sparring together. You know, I, I was the one who sparred him the whole way through his, when he won the ABAs the first time, and I was I was 16 years old, and I was more than holding my own. So uh, I knew in a couple of years, a bit more um, maturity and that, but, you know, I'd definitely go further than he did. Um, but it was good that I think we both sort of brought each other along. You know, we had that rivalry um, because we both, you know, we both wanted to be winners, you know. It was, it was a successful amateur club. There was lots of champions that came in and out, and you wanted to be the number one boy. You know, you wouldn't, um, you wouldn't be, ar- the, ar- it was no real place for the proper arrogance, and I think he had that, so that's why he didn't really fit in as much. He wasn't as liked as much as I was, um, because it is still a, a, a team event. You go and support, support the other lads, you know, who are fighting, um, because you wanted your club t- to do well, um, but yeah, he was uh, yeah, by the time, but he was never really my cup of tea. Even like now, he wouldn't be my cup of tea. We never boxed different weights. You know, I watch him on TV, and at times I do think he's a bit of a prat, and you know, he says some silly things, and he's, he, as I say, he's just not my cup of tea. So I don't think we'd ever be really, really close mates at all. But I wouldn't have anything against him. But we uh, we were rivals. We were the same weight. We had to compete against each other, um, so that's how it became what it was. How did you feel when he won gold? Any messages exchanged? Happy for him? Not really bothered? How did you feel? Uh, no, definitely wasn't wasn't particularly happy for him. <laughs> I uh, I never thought to myself, I could have done that. That should be me, um, because. I might have said it over the years without meaning it just because I thought it might wind him up, you know, or it, or it will serve its purpose or enhance my sort of profile. But I didn't think that he was good enough to win one. It's just right time, right place, you know. He wasn't ranked in ranks at all going out there. He'd been beat. He, he qualified, I think there's three qualifying events, or maybe four, because you, if you're not the host nation, you don't automatically get a place. So you have to go out and qualify. And Europe's a hard place to qualify from anyway. He failed. Say, say it was three. Say you get four attempts. He failed at the first three and only qualified with the last attempt. You know, um, he had five fights out there. First one he boxes a New Zealand kid, so that's a walkover. Um, I don't know who he boxed. I counted three. It might have been four out of the four out of the five guys he boxed in in Beijing. Already held victories over him. Darren Sutherland, who he boxed in the semi-finals, I think had was beating him four to one. They boxed five times, beat him four times. Um, the kid he boxed, the Cuban he boxed in the final, beat him on the Amir Khan um, kindling undercard or something similar. The Kazakhstani he beat um, on his way through, I think for a medal, already beat him the year before. You know, and that Kazakhstani knocked out Kovalev, uh, Kovalev uh, Korobov, who was the number one dude at the time. So. He didn't have a fortunate draw. He just he showed up, fair play to him. He showed up and he got the wins. You know, um, maybe the guys who had victories over him didn't show up on their time. Like Sutherland, I felt didn't show up. He just looked content with his bronze medal. He won. He got into a medal position. He looked like he switched off. So fair play to the girl. He got the gold. I never for a second thought that should be me because I'm sure I wouldn't know have been nowhere near ranked in the top um, top ten going into that in the world and. Um, you know, a couple of fighters probably held victories over me. I can't remember. Um, so uh, good, good, good on him. Lots of people saying this is great for you. This is just enhances your rivalry. You've got a victory over him. You just beat 
an Olympic champion. You know, last year he's gone on to win the Olympics. So when your paths cross as, as pros, you've got that over him. He knows that. Plus, it just commercially from a business side, it just adds so much more spice to the rivalry. Just more more pound size. So um, enjoy it. So yeah, there's frustration there, um, but it's it's petty. It's just that someone you don't like has gone on to do something well for themselves. So you're like, no, I'd rather him just be miserable. But uh, you don't want to be that person forever. So yeah, no, I'm, I'm, I'm part of me is happy for him, and I'm happy that for myself that it, you know, it adds to the adds to the story. You know, enhances everything around it and makes us big part players. You know, um, I've gone on to successfully be and own. An Olympic champion is in my pocket. He always will be. So that's nice that I can take that home and, and enjoy that for the rest of my days. Now, you've spoken about the build-up to the Frotch fight on num- well, numerous occasions with kind of working with Paddy. The actual fight itself, do you feel like that was the best version of you in your career? Do you think up until the stoppage, that was the best version of George Groves? Um, no, no. Because um, I, couldn't, I couldn't get rid of him. Where I was um, just going right and happy to the head. I should have, I should have mixed it up. Should have put some different shots in there. Should put some body shots in there. Should have set a couple more traps. Um, you know, not to blame Paddy at that point. It would have been nice if he took give me the right pointers. And then the sixth round was torrid for for Froch, like a real torrid, and. At that point, uh, Paddy told me to have a round off in the seventh, when really I should have just put it sustained a bit more. That would have that would have been better a better option as many as many other things throughout that fight. But you know it's hard it's hard for someone you got to call it in the moment. You know you know I as I say I you know I learned I learned from uh, from that incident that you know in future fights you know when I got someone going I'm gonna vary the attacks you know. But at that point, uh, the, 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 there's so much at stake. There's so much pressure that, you know, I just want to get this fight over with. And, you know, for me, that means throwing right hands to the head. You know, that's how I end shot. That's how I end fight. So, um, yeah, that was that. That was that. It, in many ways, it was like the the best me. Um, you know, I was I was still young. I was still unbeaten. I wasn't. Um, I was still ballsy. I was still fresh. I was still this, still that, um, and I was. i have never more up for it probably than I was then. Um, with with ex- excitement, not just the pressure. Um, so yeah, in many ways, probably one of my best performances, one of the best versions of me. But uh, in other ways, just without without that bit of experience that I gained predominantly from that fight. Were you surprised when you had him over in the first round? Did you did you anticipate? I know you had the the kind of the pre fight stuff. I'm going to hit you with two right hands, Carl. Just two. I remember it. But were you surprised when you when you had him over in the first round? Heavy, heavy knockdown as well. It wasn't like a flash knockdown that could have quite conceivably been the end of the fight. No, not at all. I mean, you don't think you're going to go and knock someone out in the first round, but I knew I was. I knew I was going to knock him out. I was like. I mean, I didn't know his chin was that good, but um, I knew he crossed his feet and he walked onto shots. And I thought, if I hit him on the chin, he's gonna go. I'm gonna hit him so hard, he's gonna go. We've done the sparring before, and like the problem with the problem sometimes with boxing. So we went up to Sheffield and we sparred um, at the Olympic camp because he was trained by Rob McCracken, and obviously he trains all that. He, he gets sparring with all them, all them amateur guys, free sparring fantastic for him great stuff great facilities I'm sure he pays a lot of money in gym fees or he did but um, yeah no, I, I'd spied him and then this one time I'd gone up Sheffield in front of all the, all the kids and sort of moving him around and I had a tendency to switch off during spars especially if it was going my way and he sort of he, he bum rushes me on the ropes like he does and he catches me right hand it's a real f- and he gives me a flash knockdown I get up I'm like oh, so annoyed it's embarrassing because everyone's here watching I just carry on but I've done plenty of other spars with him where he just couldn't land a glove on me, you know, and I just, you can hit him at will. I started thinking, well, when I'm switched on and I'm on it, this is what you get. Same with the Eubank spars. When I'm switched on, this is what you get. When I'm not, 
other stuff happens. And that's my problem. I switch off, you know. But during a fight, I have been guilty of switching off at times. But uh, to this fight, I make sure I won't be switched off, you know. And in the build-up, I wasn't switched off. Much like the Degale build-up, I'm on it for everything. I want to have a... Um, I want to be engaged. Like, brain is just firing on all cylinders. Because, you know, if you've got a verbal battle, I'm waiting to catch him for something. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump on it. I'm going to jump on it. It's that. When it's um when it's weighing day, the shirts are off. I'm mean, head to head with him, like you know, going right up. I'm confident. This is me. I'm ready for a fight. The ring walk's always the same. The ring walk's the power ring walk. We're going for a fight. You know, I'm ready. I'm getting stuck in. I'm not lardy da wandering meandering meandering my way to the ring. Um, you wouldn't do that in any other situation of of um, you know, where you're about to have a fight. You, you get you're you're on it in. Um, always to a certain degree trying to be conscious of how it looks you know i remember jumping in the ring and just being me paddy um it was paddy's fighter who sort of doubled up as security that night in the corner uh and i think it was just us three in the ring i'm gonna stand in the ring and just stare at him i thought this is gonna look really good first of all he's gonna think my oh, skis a lunatic what's he just standing there staring at me for like that on his own as well as me thinking, oh, this probably looks really good on TV. It's be good. Hopefully, someone gets a photo of this. Um, and yeah, the first round starts, and I don't know. I I didn't for one second think I was going to chill him in the first round. And the two right hands was just the fact that I wanted to know that I'm going to hit him. You know, I'm, I'm only going to throw two. I meant I was only going to throw two the whole round. He took it as a double a double right hand, which I'm glad he took it as a double <laughs> right hand because it ended up being a sort of a right hand followed by a drop back right hand that put him over. Um, and there's, there's, I've got a great photograph. And everyone in the front row, there's my dad, there's, um, like members of my team. Everyone else is like, oh, they're like, yeah, my dad's jumping up the cheering, and I'm just like, because I just thought, oh, like, no, no, no shock here. There's no shock. Neutral corner. Didn't want to gas out, so I'm thinking, right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make it. I'm gonna come in. I'm gonna faint and twitch him up. I'm gonna try and get him to punch again, and then I'm gonna hit him. But he was, he was so concussed after that that first knockdown I, I don't really think he punches and then so I hit him and I remember thinking just keep punching till the bell goes like as in even even if, if the bell goes and you've already committed to that right hand just let it go through and there's nothing friendly about this no more and that's what I hit him on the bell right hand and he, he sits down ideally it would be nice to have had another minute to have got to him and it was only a, you know, a few seconds but then I sat down the end of the first round of thought this is uh this is no shock to me. I've hit him once and he's gone over. I've got eleven rounds to do the same again. Don't need that wasn't my miracle shot. That's good. it's gonna come again. So just take your time, go out, faint him, faint him, make him make another mistake and get hold of him. Um I caught him lots, lots and lots, you know, second, third, fourth. So nothing as heavy as the first round where I probably did catch him a bit cold as well. But I punched him numb. He's one of them fighters that can get punched numb. So the right hands in the end, just doom, doom. Sixth round, he sits down and he's like, fucking hell, he says to his uh, McCracken. He's probably still dizzy, but, and he don't know what to do. But to his credit, he's one of them, he's one of them guys who just bites down like I'm sure that keeps punching. Even though he's petrified, that's that's what he, he punches himself out of a bad situation. Um, to his credit, you know, he's not interested in holding, he's not interested in moving, he probably can't really do either of them things too well, he punches what way out of a bad situation, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not Andre Ward, I don't have, I've never had the coaching that he's had through, um, you know, I've never worked with anyone as, as it probably is, as cute, uh, intelligent as boxing as, as uh, Virgil Hunter, so, you know, I didn't do I didn't do the the, the the tying up the clever tying up things to uh to, to grab a breather or to pull him off guard and hit him with this do that. So uh at that point it was just just keep just, just keep punching. So as I say seventh round, um Paddy told me to take a breather and I feel that probably gave him a bit of confidence and a bit of reassurance. Eighth round I, I hit I think I hit him again, I can't remember if it gets stopped in the eighth or the ninth, but it's the ninth. Mm. At that point, literally, the first time he lets his hands go, uh, nothing really lands. We, we're both a bit, a bit, a bit um, 
wobbly on the legs, but not through getting hit, just through um, fatigue. Do you know what I mean? If I've been whacking a heavy bag for nine rounds, I'm going to be tired. Do you know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, how fast jumps in, and I'm just like, oh my God, I can't believe this. Um, again, like, you're, I think to myself, what does he seen? Like, what do I look like I've been hurt? Because I don't, I'm definitely not hurt. I don't feel it. Like, oh, for God's sake, what have I done? Like, you almost, you're blaming yourself at that point. You think, oh, how have I, if I fucked this up after all this, what have I done wrong? And then, but then you just look, look around, you see everyone else's face, you're like, Oh, I've been stitched up <laughs> and you watch it back you're like I've been stitched up um, so yeah it was um, I, I, I go back to the original point I, I wasn't shocked putting him over uh, just disappointed not disappointed he got back up just disappointed I couldn't put him back down and keep him down yeah. rematch took a lot on in that rematch outside the ring I think it's when you started managing you brought Luke Watkins on um, obviously a massively hyped build up do you regret any of that? Do you think you kind of expended mental, emotional energy in the build-up that potentially you didn't need to in the second fight? Yeah, definitely, definitely, um, like definitely, it was taxing. But I was still young and fresh, had no kids, you know. It was like <coughs> away we go, you know. Like um, some of the things, some of the media obligations I took on would were, were draining, like. Um, some of them, I was like, oh, you know, one day we was in we was in the sky for six, seven hours, and I know because the last thing we did was um, the face to face one, which I wanted it to be really good, and I still haven't watched it because I know at the time I didn't perform satisfactory to me, and it's the one where you stand up and we do a little handshake and he push and pull, and I'm like, I just want to give him a, a strong handshake. He interprets that as I'm gonna yank you across the table. And then you're just you're trying to think like, what does this look like for a split second? And while that split second kicks in, you're like, you know, you might. Then you're thinking, ah, I I'm, now I look like I'm hesitating. Didn't have, I always had an answer. I always knew what was coming my way, but like something like getting pulled across the table, I didn't. So I was like, I don't have an answer for this. I just have to let that go. And that sort of, um, I can't remember if that was at the start or the end of the interview, but that sort of half sets me off on the wrong wrong footing as well as me being exhausted like mentally exhausted after so much media that day till that point <coughs> but did it have a bearing on the fight not sure i was i was in great condition i trained really hard i made time for the gym i always tactic wise i think that was just the wrong thing that i should have jumped on him from the start carried on from the first fight where that's exactly what I said was going to happen that's exactly what I promised everyone was going to happen but really box him and, ca and catch him late why did I let him off off the hook why did I not try and hit him and buzz him early and, and then and jump on him because I could always hit him but whether as I say they were trying to conserve energy come late I'm not, I'm not that sort of fighter do you know what I mean I'll fight from the start and I'll fight till I'm exhausted you know that, that'll that be it and I'll just get through the rounds um Media wise, I, I took on a lot, but at that point, you know, I couldn't have done that later on in my career. It would have been just too much. But at that point, I don't think it got in the way of the gym work, and I feel it had the benefit of make, making it a super fight, which in turn made me a, a big name in boxing. And this works why I can still sit here now and, and, and do interviews because um, we made some history, you know. And off the back of that, there's not, not many other fighters out there who win a world title at the fourth attempt. and people care about him you know it's because I had back to back defeats and um, Cage Froch in massive massive high profile fights you know a year later I'm fighting on the under on an undercard um, in Vegas that no one should really care about against a guy who people didn't care about um, but people did because of what had happened before so um, everything was worth its while you know I think definitely uh would have been nice to have won. It would have been nice to have just not got knocked out. <laughs> but, um, you know, so, 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 so be it. You know, so be it. It's, uh, I learned a lot from it. And I think it's made me a better, a better human being for it in the long run. Maybe not not, not even just a, a better fighter. So, it's okay. You just mentioned the fact that a year later you boxed Badu Jack. Returned to Las Vegas. So, you were there when you were 12 years old. And now you're there fighting for a world title. What was the whole experience like? 
I think I over, I think I peaked too early for that fight. Um, I couldn't get to grip with the altitude of of Big Bear. So, but really, what had happened was I'd wanted to get it right so much that time that I got fit too quickly. I got light too quickly. Um, my my best spar was literally before we left. By the time I got out there, nothing was really flowing too well, and I just put it down to the fact that oh, it's altitude. So. That's why I'm feeling flat and stuff like that. And then um, just got really homesick, which I don't get as such. You know, when boxing's involved, and that's that's why, that's the reason for it. I don't get homesick, but that time I got really homesick. Obviously, the pressure of it being your third attempt at a world title um, was kicking in. Uh, we'd studied Badu Jack. We knew that he wasn't as bad or as, or as that ordinary as people were making out. Um, we knew that, you know, just because he'd had I think he'd, he'd only had one loss at the time, which was a first, yeah, first round stoppage. Where he obviously got caught cold. That it wasn't just a knockover job. Still was really confident beating him, beating him well. But um, you know, it was it was it was it was strange. By the time the fight came round, we went to Vegas. People saying, "Oh, you're so excited! It must be so exciting to fight on the Mayweather card." It's like I've boxed at Wembley Stadium. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Like Eighty thousand people, like ask Cole Frotch. You know, it's like it was a big deal. This is a come down, major come down for me. I'm doing it out of necessity. I'm hoping this is going to now open the door and I'll be back where I want to be. I'm chasing it for now for nearly two years. Like, I'm 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 on the catch up. Like, so no, it's not a big deal. I don't care. I couldn't care less. In fact, it's a major inconvenience because um, you won't give me enough wristbands or everything else that goes on, you know, in the states. Uh, so yeah, so come come come, Badu Jack. I was. Uh, I was with my wife um, in Las Vegas uh, hotel room. I think we st- we stayed at the Vidara. Um, she was we was in the bathroom. Um, I was laying in the bath, looking at a nice bath there, and it had a sort of like a apex sort of window, like the corner suite, so you could just sort of sit there and look out. Um, and it's sort of time to reflect on on what's going on in your life. Uh, Vidara didn't have a casino, so that's why uh, they probably have those reflecting uh, bathrooms. Because if you just lost all your money downstairs in the casino, you want to go upstairs and reflect on it. Um, but I just remember thinking, oh, I'm just so desperate to get this over with, being really emotional, a bit teary. And that's not ideal to be in that situation, literally a couple of hours before you're boxing. You definitely don't want to be in the bath soaking, it's just going to make you tired. Um, we thought we'd learned from our mistakes before, so we insisted on a on a private dressing room where we wasn't prepared to share. I'm thinking this can't be hard at the MGM Grand. They must have like thousands of dressing rooms. They didn't. They gave us literally like a toilet cubicle to warm up in. As I'm about to do pads, Barry O'Connell dropped a bucket of ice and water on the floor. Like, not his fault. I was like, okay, so we just do pads in this little corner over here. Um fight came they didn't play my music they played some other random uh ring entrance music you know it it was like the old me would have been right well i'm not ring walking until they play my rap music and i thought i was the old me so i started i was like i'm not ring walking until they play my music but after about 45 seconds and my my music wasn't going to kick in i was like let's just go <laughs> and that's literally how how i was feeling at that point and that's why I didn't win, you know, because it was just like, part of me was, was beaten, you know, part of me was just like, right, well, I'm no longer that, that invincible person that I, that I was in the frotch fights, you know, I'd now been, been almost conquered and I was just ready to, I was just, just wanted this chapter over with, I was sick to death of being the guy who hadn't, hadn't achieved. And obviously, since the the time in between losing to Frotch two and getting to Badu Jack, you know, they asked me. I do interviews. I'm aware of what I say and what people are going to think. And then one of the first interviews, like, so what do you think about the Frotch fights? And I thought I can say, but I still think I'm better than him. And I knew I'd get a massive backlash for it, but I thought. So I'm doing it anyway. <laughs> uh, I still think I'm better than him. And it was just like, oh, you just got ironed out, you deluded, the rest of it. So that just made me angry, just give me the ump. You know, I'd gone from 
from selling out Wembley Stadium, career highest purse, you know, on the verge of saying, to not being able to fill Wembley Arena next door and fighting for free. I was on a, I was on a percentage of profits and the show made a loss. Got nothing. Then I'm fighting on, on the undercard of Bellew Cleverly. Uh, just to keep pace, you know, just to keep keep relationship good with Sky. They're not going to give me my own dates. They're not, you know, it was like, it was a fight where I was on a percentage of profits. So the money was okay. The show done better than it should have. Um, but it was like, to, to keep me happy, I need to do this every every month <laughs> and that's not going to happen so um let's just let's just concentrate on winning this world title and then all if it's going to come back come back to life and uh it was a, like 10 months later or something silly like that before i actually fought in vegas and then lose a split so it's like okay right do we just nip this in the bud now and call it a day or do we uh do we try again um obviously i did did decide to, to go it again but it was a uh, that was a ter- terribly terribly low part of my life like um everything to build up to the jack fight the fight itself and then obviously directly after part of me was at peace because it was like straight away the next day i said said to um to paddy thank you for your time because it's important to thank people for their time even if you think their time was <laughs> wasn't worth it but i said thank you for your time um, I appreciate you've done your best, you know, and I, maybe part of me didn't want the confrontation of saying, why, why, <laughs> why did you make all these stupid decisions? Why did you let me down in so many other ways? But then, you know, at that point, it's like, I'm not that, not that person. I had a good neck fight. That, I mean, I spoke to, I actually spoke to Senior about this yesterday, because obviously he had his own experience with Michael Watson, and he kind of said that, it took something from him as a fighter. How much did it take from you as a fighter? Um, it was, uh, I don't know, because you got to like, you got to cancel yourself. You, know, you really got to cancel in yourself. You know, you got you got to sit down and, and really go for it all. And sometimes you feel differently day to day. Uh, but I know it was, it was, it's horrific, you know. I saw him a few days after the fight in hospital, and he looked like half the man he was, you know, the Saturday before. It literally looked like half of him wasted away. It, it didn't make no sense to me how he, someone could look so different. Um, I went with, I think I went with Nissa Sowland, and he's definitely his dad, his brother, his sister, his wife was there. Um, and it was like, you feel so sorry. You're like, ah, oh. you you feel responsible. You feel like this is this is my fault. I should have I, for a while after I was thinking, did I know? Did I not? Should is there more I should have done? Should I have just said, nah, that's enough now? You know, um, demand it, pull him out, and then you start thinking, oh, am I being selfish? Am I just saying that so that you know I could have that? that satisfaction of, of being of being in the know and knowing the right thing and did I did I even really know it or did I not? If I did know it, why did I, you know, continue you know, punching him in the head, whatnot? You know, I put my my knees before his. Um plus <laughs> it was on a cyclone show, so no disrespect to the guys, you know, I love them to death, but they're like it was channel five. Um it was just a keep busy fight. They know that, you know, it fulfilled their their obligations, it fulfilled mine. Eddie Goodnick, I I was already in line to fight for a world title. It literally was just a keep busy fight, a bit of a payday. Um, it it was it was unnecessary. So that was like right. I just put everything in perspective. It's like well, I only really want the necessary fights from now on. It's the reason that I've stopped now, and I am. It's just, yeah, it was, it was, it was, it was, it was, a, it was a horrible, horrible, horrible thing to be a part of, and 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 still is, you know, still is. Did you, did you have to, as best as you could? I mean, I appreciate it's probably it's impossible. I'm assuming to kind of completely eradicate it from your mind, but did you have to make a conscious effort to to try and shelf it as best you could while you carried on fighting? 
Uh, yeah, I think I think as as time went on, um, it was easier to not be at the forefront of my mind like during during training during fights. He was still on my mind at, uh, during the Tudor fight. Mm. I I I know that because I remember feeling it straight after. Um, because obviously Tudor, you, you just I just kept hitting him, and he just seemed to not be sort of phased by it. I was hitting him a lot harder. Than I was hitting good necks, and um, so it's like. But that, you know, everyone's different. There's different circumstances. I think it's different, different preparations. You know, a lot, lot, a lot of the time, people have pre-existing conditions that haven't been you know, discovered or you know disclosed. Um, something can go. Something can happen in training camp. Something can happen in the fight prior. It could be the way you made weight. There's lots of, and and the the sports changing. The fighters becoming better athletes. The gloves are becoming a little bit more specialized. You know, the even down to the uh you know the the the, the checks the health checks are sort of fifty fifty. Now you've been involved in some of the highest profile moments and from the Rubik's cube to the press conferences you, you've said and done some things that really do stick in the memory. I think one of the biggest memories that I'll have of your career is the post fight interview with Chilinov. You're somebody who you mentioned earlier on you you like to convey this kind of chest out and have been well prepared and well rehearsed that struck me as just something completely raw and from the heart explain to me the feeling of, of overcoming obviously you mentioned edward goodnecht in that in that speech just try and explain to me the feeling if you can of winning that world title and and those 15 20 minutes afterwards um so it's uh it's a feeling of it is a feeling of happiness and joy but not there's nothing it's just relief like it's it's the feeling of relief like something bad was on the verge it felt like something bad was on the verge of happening and it's a relief that it didn't happen you know uh and then you for me it's like wow well, I can move on with my life you know I have I've been treading water now for years, like trying to get on with my life, and I can't. But now I can finally get on with my life, and this is a just a massive relief. Like you could, you could feel years of um, pressure, the weight on my shoulders, just relieving itself. And and what comes with that is the exhaustion. It's like it's like it's like when people go on holiday and get sick. It's because like they're working so hard at home, they haven't got time to get sick. They go on holiday, relax, and like oh. I've got the flu. <laughs> That's literally how it felt. And I, you know, you, you see the footage of me in the change room after. We're not jumping up and down with champagne, celebrating. It's just like it's very quiet, and that's because everyone's been through that journey with me. You know, through from my wife, my solicitor, my physio, Shane and the boys from McGuigan's. You know, even my security team have had them on since before the game. With the same faces, just there, as well as some real close friends and family. And everyone's just like. Oh, Thank God, brilliant. As well as I've got a broken jaw, and cuts over the face. You know, I've got to have um, got to get stitched up like a mailbag in the back of you know Sheffield, um, Sheff, Sheff, Sheffield United football round. And that. So um, yeah, it was just it just 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 um, just relief. Okay, well, George Groves, um, we've covered everything here that we didn't cover. Um, when I was at Wasserman. Anything that I have missed out is in that other interview, so people watching this um, can find that. Just want to say again, as I did in the very first, um, well, not the very first interview, but in that interview at Wasserman, congratulations on your career. Um, you've built a tremendous career. You've got a lovely home, which I'm very humbled that you've invited me to today. You did it your way, which is something that I've said and a lot of other people have said, and in boxing, that's not an easy thing to do. It's certainly not an easy thing to do and come out on top and at the top so congratulations on a fantastic career um whatever you turn your hand to next whether it be motivational speaking managing fighters landscape gardening i don't know whatever it is i'm sure you'll be a fantastic success um ladies and gentlemen the saint george groves thanks very much for speaking to boxing social and i'm sure i'll catch up with you soon and look forward to it thanks george cheers thanks a lot nice one. Cheers. So that was former WBA super middleweight champion George Groves. Um, Coogan, 
again, I mean, this is going to be a kind of a recurring theme of our conversations. You've known George for a lot longer than I have. Incredible career. Incredible career. I first saw George Groves fight at the Manchester Arena when he fought Charles Adamu, which was on the undercard of Hay and Ruiz. That's the first time I ever saw George Groves fight. Um, and then I wasn't even filming. Like I wasn't doing IFL then. And then obviously the first major fight that we actually covered like eight years ago was the Gale Groves. It was actually the first major press conference we ever went to. Um, they held it in Dale Youth inside the ring. They don't do that anymore. No. They don't do that kind of thing anymore. Um, and yeah, that was kind of, yeah, our first real big press conference. And ever since then, one of a select few fighters that will always give the time of day, whether that's in victory or defeat, um, George is always giving us time. I don't remember any time over that kind of eight year period of a fight we've covered and I think to be honest with you, there's probably only the Badu Jack fight that I didn't cover. The rest of all George's fights we'd covered and even after those Carl Froch defeats, managed to interview him after both of those. Um, yeah, slightly awkward, but he still did it. So no fair play to him, brilliant career, won everything and uh, probably making the right decision, probably. Are you surprised that he called it a time, called it an end? I mean, yes. you got the Gale Eubank coming up. A lot of people thought he potentially was going to get the rematch with the Gale. The Gale came through that. Yeah, I think if George decided to stay on, I think there are probably at least two, maybe three fights out there still for him to kind of end his career on. But positives about this is that he obviously feels as if the, the tank's empty now or the desire isn't there. And he's kind of bringing a... Uh, a curtain on his career off his own back on his own terms so that's always good to see rather than George go and fight a fighter and lose to a fighter that he would never have lost two years ago or you know because that's always the danger mm. um, there's no shame in what happened in Jeddah back in September Callum Smith is a formidable fighter and he's getting better and he will get better so there's no shame in that, but what a career he's had, you're right. You were at that fight, weren't you? Yes. Wearing some choice attire, if I remember correctly. Yes, I dressed with the national attire, um, which I was a little bit sceptical about, but only because I didn't want people, the nationals, to think that it was any way kind of... You don't think like taking the piss. Like, yeah. yeah, I didn't want them to think that. That was kind of my main main concern of that. So I spoke to quite a few nationals out there. In fact, I spoke to about four or five different people and I said to them, showed them a picture with me on it. I didn't rock up with it on and say, <laughs> what do you think, boys? I said, what, what do you think of this? And they loved it. They absolutely loved it. They said, definitely. I said, I'm going to wear this on fight night. Is this okay? They were like, yes. And they were encouraging me to wear it. So... What was the atmosphere like out there? Strange place for boxing. Very Lock, strange. Yeah. Very strange. Um, no alcohol, no music, no dancing. No ring card girls? Yeah. So it was a little bit different to what we're used to, but there's nothing wrong with that. It's just, it's just different to the shows that we are accustomed to in either the UK or the US. Mm. So packed out crowd there, and I mean, they loved it. You could tell. They were kind of edge of their seat stuff on especially the the main event with Smith and Groves and um, it was just yeah it was kind of like a theatre mm. they were like watching a performance where you wouldn't be jumping up and down and shouting and stuff so it was it was an eye opener to there is a world outside of <laughs> the UK and yeah. the US for fights and wherever but um would I go back there if there was a major fight? Absolutely. Um, yeah, it was one of the one of the better kind of places I've visited last year. Staying with George and kind of his career, you've just mentioned. I mean, you interviewed him after the first and second Froch fights. Um, 
you did the, the Gale press conference and the, kind of the build-up and the aftermath after that fight. Is there any one in particular moment, probably difficult for you because you've, you've been around his career for so long, that sticks out for you with George? No, pr- probably the, the first Frotch fight because I went into his restroom room um, afterwards. His whole family were in there. His whole team was in there. I mean, drop dead silence. So I've walked in there. I kind of, I didn't really know what to do. I didn't want to walk straight up to George and go, all right, George, fancy doing an interview. It's just, <laughs> yeah. I wasn't going to do that. So I kind of had to sort of bide my time in there for like 10 minutes or so. And I can't remember who I spoke to, but I wouldn't have gone up to George directly at, at the time. I think I probably would have asked someone on his team if they would ask him because he may say to me that he would do it when he really don't want to do it mm. whereas someone from his team would probably tell me it's probably not, probably right not a good idea so he did it and it was it was only awkward because it was so silent and in the dressing room it's not really silent mm. but on that obviously particular occasion it was really silent and I was like in the middle and everyone was listening and I was like and that was like four or five years ago of you know so yeah, did that and then at Wembley, I waited for George outside when he was going home, basically getting a lift back to wherever. And I literally just then I did, I just asked him, I said, George, have you got have you got a couple of minutes? And he did after you know, what happened in front of as Mr. Frotch keeps reminding us, eighty thousand people at <laughs> Wembley. Um But yeah, I, I, things like that are kind of stick in your brain that after what happened, why would he want to talk to anyone, really? Like, fair enough, Sky or whatever, but why would he want to talk to anyone? So I appreciate that, that he kind of thought, no, I'm going to do this here. And that was that was kind of, yeah, that was good. I mean, it's kind of a measuring stick of, you have this way of, you are friendly with a lot of fighters and you've known fighters for a long time, but in the same vein, if you you weren't good at what you do. I don't think he would have given you that time. So I mean, it's like having time with George after those two fights is really something to, to cherish. I can imagine I've been turned down by fighters who have had wins, let alone crushing losses in front of 80,000 people. Mm. So I think that's kind of a, a massive credit to you, really, the fact that he's willing to do it. Yeah, I think post-fight interviews are quite, I think eight, nine times out of ten, the winner's interview you'll probably get, especially in the UK, shall we mm. say, we'll probably get. The losing interview isn't always easy to get, dependent on how the fight's gone, how crushing the defeat is. You know, I, I think if they've been robbed or they believe they've been robbed, I think that's probably the easiest way of getting an interview <laughs> yeah. because they want to kind of vent their, um, yeah, their anger. Um, I remember just, just going off a little bit off subjects when Rosado lost to Martin Murray in Liverpool a year ago whenever and I, I kind of walked into Rosado's dressing room and he was getting mad like mental and I was like do I go in here do I not go in here and he's like he co- he saw me at the corner of his eye and just like Coogan man get in here turn the camera on I'm like alright okay so he's obviously he wants to talk so yeah that was just yeah interesting story are you being sarcastic <laughs> that is a good that's a good that is a good story I'm joking it's not a story it's just a, it's a, an example I'm backing my shit up can you swear on here by the way yeah what well you just did what can't we say on here I don't know the L-bomb what's the L-bomb we don't know the L-bomb no alright well I won't say it then if you don't know what it is we can always um, edit it out Looking forward to this weekend, myself and Mr. Coogan Cassius have caught up with James DeGale and Chris Eubank Jr. this week. I was lucky enough to speak to Chris Eubank Sr. yesterday down in Brighton at Chris Eubank Jr.'s Open Media Workout. Check out what he said. This is Rob Tebbett for Boxing Social. Delighted to be joined, as always, by Chris Eubank Sr. English, nice to see you again. It's been a long while. How are you? Excellent. Thank you. I just came back from Africa and the Middle East, and uh, I just want to say again, 
Africa, Africa, Africa. Talk to me about this fight. Chris Eubank Jr. versus James DeGale. Jr. is on track. Um, the work ethic has been remarkable, as always. If his mind is in the right place and he turns up, you're going to see a sensational performance. If it isn't, it'll still be a sensational performance, although he may not use the correct tools or strategy. Now, you mentioned that if Junior turns up. Are you referring to past performances where yeah. Chris hasn't shown what you believe is his best form? Yeah, he hasn't. He, I mean, against Groves, he didn't show his best form. He didn't turn up to that fight. Um, uh, that was sometimes said of myself in my career that sometimes I didn't show up. Certainly in the uh, Saunders fight, he didn't show up. Well, he showed up six rounds later. Yeah, six <laughs> rounds later. No, you, you can't do that. So, no, I think he's going to be okay. But let's see. It's, it's going to be a tough fight. What's going to happen is um, James is on his game. I've heard that he's really on his game. And so, you know, it's not about, oh, the guy's on, dec on the decline. Junior's not fighting someone on the decline. He's fighting James DeGale. So decline doesn't come into it. So don't underestimate your man because he will be up for this. So that's why it's going to be a very good fight. So ITV, Al Heyman have been very clever in actually putting these two combatants together. This is a fight that you yourself and, and Junior have, have lobbied for for a long period of time. Did you ever think that this would actually happen? James DeGale is, James DeGale is in the past pretty much poo-pooed the idea and now the fight is happening. Yeah. Is it a surprise to you? No, of course not. If you're in the same trade, then, you, you know, it's going to come about when you're the same weight. So, you know, when someone talks somebody something down, it doesn't mean it's not going to happen. You know, it's, uh, it has to happen. You're in the same weight. And then, obviously, the bad blood from the sparring session all those years ago and the behavior of, uh, or the words, or the language, or the mindset of James, you know, our son. You know, he, I say our son because effectively they're our sons. And it's really a sport to the spectators. So, you know, we, we wish him no ill. We wish him, you know, a safe fight. If Junior turns up, then he's in danger. If Junior doesn't turn up, who knows, what, who knows what's going to happen. The most important contest of his career? Financially it is because... You know, the winner of this fight wins a pay-per-view platform. You know, and you know, over the last two and a half years, I've done everything I can. You know, uh, at the expense of my my family structure, at the expense of my dignity, at the expense of my my uh, reputation, to stay with ITV um, because I believe, you know, it can be much bigger than Sky, but Sky is far more aggressive than ITV. That's all it is. So we just want. Or I can see where if ITV becomes aggressive in this field that they can become uh, a juggernaut, effectively. Um, so I've stayed with it. And so, you know, Junior now has the ability to win a pay-per-view platform as well as, you know, a huge career with Al Heyman. So by that token, the James Nagel fight, in effect, is the most important fight of Chris's career. Is he the most difficult opponent of Chris's career? He could be. He could be, you know, because you've got tools, you know, you've got your punches, you've got your strategy. It's whether you can apply yourself to the correct strategy. Now we've mentioned already, already the sparring of years gone by. You've already said that you don't believe that James is, is on the decline. You believe he'll show up. What's changed, though, since those sparring? In both Chris, in both James, in, in yourself even, what's changed since those early days when, when Chris and James first sparred? Well, I don't know what goes on in the mind of anybody else. Okay. So, I don't know. I know in my mind, it doesn't change. You know, I have mastered this particular craft, this art. I'm not bigging myself up, but sit me in front of any of the trainers. They're only going to, we're only going to agree. You, because really, the ingredients are all the same. You don't underestimate anyone. When you do, you don't have your firepower. Fear. Without fear, you, you don't have a spark. You don't have the impetus to actually do the work you're supposed to do. All of these principles and the spiritual aspect of the sport comes into play. So I can make sense of it. 
and speaking to these other trainers, they would say, well, there's nothing wrong in what he's saying. No one's going to teach me. Sorry, let me rephrase that. It's going to be very hard to teach someone like uh, any fighter who's been in there at this level, at top level, and have come through fights, who have taken beatings, who have done their losing, who have done their winning, who have won championships, who have lost championships. You know, and if you're cognitive, which by the grace of God I remain cognitive, I can put it all together. I can connect the dots. So don't let anyone talk me down saying, oh, you can't listen to him. Yes, you can. You don't have to actually take the advice, but I'm sure if you actually speak or hear what I have to say, it will only better you. Um, yeah, so there you are. Just picking up on what you've just said there about kind of underestimating your man and potentially not having that spark. Do you think that's potentially what happened with Chris Eubank Jr. against George Groves and, and before that, Billy Joe? Yeah, most certainly, yeah. Uh, Billy Joe, not so much, but certainly with George Groves because he had beat them up so terribly for uh, maybe, I don't know how many sparring sessions. You know, he would have beaten George Groves up like 90% of the time. It was embarrassing. I mean, I remember saying to... George, don't be dejected. He was sitting on the chair, hands down, head down. I said, he was getting ready to fight DeGale. I said, that's why you're going to beat him. You're going to beat him because you're under pressure here. It's good for you. Okay. Final one, just on Nate Vasquez. Now, I've had the pleasure of speaking to Ronnie Davis today, somebody who I don't need to explain to you, lovely man, very knowledgeable boxing man. He's now got some company in the corner in the shape of Nate Vasquez. Just your thoughts on that. Did Chris consult you before that happened? Oh, uh, yes. And your thoughts on it? No comment. I mean, no comment. What can I, what can I say? Have you been pleased with the work? Um, he has to be pleased. Okay. You see, I know what I'm looking at. You know, if you, if you bring somebody in to do a job, if it's the same job that I did... What, what are you going to show me? Something? You're going to show me something new I haven't seen? Chris Eubanks Sr., English. Always a pleasure catching up with you. Thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social, and I look forward to the next time we cross paths. Good. Very good. So that was Chris Eubanks Sr., English. Um, been to Africa, apparently. You've got an interesting relationship with Mr. English, haven't you? Interesting is the right word. Mm. It's no secret for some time. Mr. Senior uh, didn't allow me to interview him or his child. Why? As why, why, why was junior. that? Yeah, junior. Yeah. I don't really know, to be honest. Wasn't that to do with swearing or something yeah, on the and channel? So, yeah, he said... Um, my language was atrocious. He said to me, what would my mother think? And I thought, do you know, when he said that, I thought, if my mum watched an interview and heard me swear, she would definitely phone me up and say, why are you doing that? So he had a point with that. So he came to me like, this was like when Eubank fought children off, mm. like a massive lecture. And I was kind of listening to him like my dad. He was my dad. <laughs> And he was like, I'm not going to do the voice. And uh, I, uh, every, everybody does the voice. You have to try the voice. Go on. Corgan. <laughs> you should not use profanity in <laughs> That's your... That's quite good. Anyway, so he was telling me I shouldn't, I shouldn't swear. And he said that he would give me a six-month probation period that he wanted to see. <laughs> this is what he said to me. Um, no swearing in my interviews. And then he would consider it. So I thought, okay whatever uh, I'd already interviewed Chris before Chris was actually fighting at Blue Water uh, against I'm pretty certain it was Ty and yeah Booth. it was Ty and Booth yes and I interviewed Chris like in the shopping centre at the weigh-in spoke about Billy Joe Saunders there nothing's changed I don't think any of my interviews with Chris Eubank truly have never consisted of Billy Joe Saunders so but then there was a massive gap between then and when um, 
Eubank for Reynold Quinlan. And I kind of got in touch with some people on Eubank's team and I just said, look, what's the crack? I'm not, really don't want to come down now and film a press conference and then go home. You you know that pain. Mm. If you had to go and film a press conference but you couldn't get the interviews, mm. you would have to really consider whether you were going to go down there or not. Mm -hmm. And that's not like a, I'm only going there if I can interview. It's uh, that's the interviews are really yes, you're not there to do. If you can't exactly. go to do your job, if you if you're in a different a different line of work and yeah. you can't go in to actually do your job, you're probably not going to go to work. But so yeah. they, they did a, a thing on the London Eye. I don't know if you remember that. Mm. So I interviewed Junior for like 40 minutes that day. Interviewed Senior for like 50 minutes that day, and then since then, yeah, touch wood. Everything's been okay. <laughs> we touch that wood. Um, but yeah, interesting. I mean, I get on well with Junior. I think I find him to be a sound guy. I know people have got their kind of opinions about whatever, but I think he's quite happy to play the bad guy, etc. But I quite, I like Junior. I haven't got a problem with him. He kind of sees me, I think, as Billy Joe's, in his words, bum chum. Yeah, I remember that. What yeah, he referred funny. to <laughs> Billy Joe as. But I'm quite, Billy Joe is my friend out of most people. So... I'm not really going to disagree if someone's saying, oh, well, you're friends with Billy Joe. Let's talk about the fight. James the Girl versus Chris Eubank Jr. Um, I think quite a well-matched fight. I don't think, with all due respect, a couple of years ago, people would have necessarily seen it that way when James the Girl was world champion and, and Chris Eubank Jr. was, well, certainly after the loss to Billy Joe and even recently as, as losing to, to Groves before the Girl had his fights with Caleb Truax. What do you make of the fight? I really like this fight. And I think it makes sense now more so than ever for the pair of them because you're right, a few years ago, James is kind of so far ahead <coughs> in terms of where he was in his career. I mean, after he beat Darrell, he went on a run of like, up until the Truax fight of back-to-back -back defenses in America, mainly. So... Eubank was kind of still trying to recover from the Billy Joe Saunders defeat. That's the truth. He had to kind of build himself back up from that point into contention to the George Groves fight, which is what he did. Uh, so the fight could have happened, but it more makes sense now for both their careers. I mean, I think it's more important, say more important, I'm saying for kind of whatever's left of their careers, for James the Gale because James DeGale is kind of at that stage, whether he wins or lose, he may only have another a year or so left anyway, possibly. Mm. Eubank Jr., that's why he's not really talking about this retirement thing or playing along with this retirement thing, because, yes, if he loses, it puts him in a really kind of difficult position because he has to work himself back into contention uh, for another big fight. But is it the end of the world for Eubank? I'd say no. Um, but every time Eubank kind of talks his game up, Billy Joe Saunders a few years ago, uh, George Groves, now Eubank, um, DeGale rather, it's like, right, you have to deliver now. Mm. And I think people were kind of, some people were backing him for that Groves fight off the back of thinking, all right, that Saunders fight was a few years ago. Let's see what you are now. And he finds himself in his position again. Push mm. you for a prediction? No. No. You know I fence it. Yeah. Uh, what, you don't? I predict a great fight. The fans are the winners. The fans are the winners. <laughs> um, you don't predict either though, do you? No, not really. Um... It's difficult, and this is something we'll come on to when we do our our bit later on. Um, it's difficult for us to kind of go out on a limb. I know people who have been turned down interviews for making predictions on fights. Yes. I know loads of coaches, no names mentioned, that have gone absolutely mental because there was this su a suggestion of you picking a fighter. One instance of this, I know we're going to talk about this more in our bit, but... Quig, I interviewed Quig in the back of a van. <laughs> True story. Back of a van, outside Gallagher's gym, before he was going to fight Carl Frampton. I don't think even the fight would, has even been announced yet. So, 
Quig was like, you fence it a lot. You, you need to come off that fence. And I said, what are you talking about? I've got to stay neutral. My opinion is relevant, which it is. Mm. That's like, like the whole thing around it. I know people like, and if someone sees me in the street or in a par park, <laughs> <laughs> a park, a bar, a strip club, a, a strip, Calm down, mate. Hold on, strip church, sorry, <laughs> strip church. If someone sees me, I'm quite happy to have that conversation with them, like who I think is going to win, and that's fine. I don't just sit there like hiding from people, going, "I'm not answering your questions." <laughs> but uh, Quig was really pushing me, right? And he was going, "You never say who's going to win fights." I said, "I don't know. Why would I? Like, why would I?" And he was like, "Who do you think wins out of me and Frampton?" Oh. And I said, "Don't go there." And he's like, "No, go on, go on." And he was pushing it and pushing it. And I just, I come out with, Frampton stops you late. Oh, how did that go? It didn't go down well with <laughs> like J Joe and that. Did Quig mind? Quig didn't care. I, and do you know what? After it, after I did it, I spoke to Joe about it. And I said, Joe, look, it's not like I'm just coming out with it. You watched the interview. You can see Quig doing that. Podding. Go on, do it. Go on, I dare you. Didn't have to tell him that you thought he'd stop him. Well, if you're going to do it, you <laughs> might as well go all out. Well, I got that bit wrong. But yeah. Quig, you can't... So Quig's one of them people. But yeah, mate, he might go away thinking, you prick. <laughs> back, back in Carl. But he wouldn't take it personally. He wouldn't like... But I know if I said that to some fighters, I know 100% they would be like, make it awkward for me to kind of interview them. Mm. I, I already get called Fury fanboy, AJ fanboy. Oh, you're in Frank Warren's pocket. Oh, you're in Eddie Earl's pocket. Well, use your common sense. You can't be in everyone's fucking pocket. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? You can't be biased towards everyone. That, if you're biased towards everyone in boxing, that probably means you're not biased. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. That is very true. So people are like, oh, you're, you're, you're a Brook fan. You're a Khan fan. You're a this fan. Yeah, yeah. I, t I say it to all of it, yes, but you can't. Being biased is you favouring one over the other, not you have someone. To be, you have to either be a fan of everyone. Someone said on my Instagram the other, sucking everyone off. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a that's a conversation for a different time. Uh, do you know what this actually reminds me? Of? It reminds me of LA walking around the Staples Center on Wilder Fury fight night, and you asking probably ten Fury fans in front of me. So Rob, who do you think is going to win the fight? Which was great. I yeah. did do that because yeah. I, I did thought do I that. thought Wilder was going to win the fight, and I've told Ben Davison this. I haven't told Fury because didn't get an interview with Tyson in LA. Um, but I I thought Tyson would outbox him, and I thought eventually Wilder would catch up with him, which is exactly what happened. But Fury got up somehow. To, but to be fair, you couldn't have. No one could have ever predicted this. I mean, one of Ted Cheeseman's friends won like 10 grand from yeah, the yeah. draw but that's a, that's a fluke but it's a weird one because people are like who's going to win who's going to win who's going to win and it's like your heart rules your head sometimes and it's like or vice versa it's just how it is and I think a lot of people who back fighters I'm not talking about me and you I'm talking about in general they back them and they believe they're going to win because they're a fan of them. Mm. But there's, there are people out there that will give an honest opinion. Look, I'm a Fury fan, but I think Joshua beats him. Or I'm a Joshua fan, but he couldn't live with Fury. Mm. There are fans like that, but a lot of people are completely blinded by the fact of, like, that's my fighter, which is good. That, that, it's good. They're backing him no matter what. There'll be a lot of casual fans out there that, can we say casual on here? Yeah, why not? Is that the C word you were referring to? Right? <laughs> that is the C word. The casual. I'm the biggest casual I know. Absolutely. Um, no, but you, you speak to fans and they're like, they are, tend to be one or other. Let's just use the Fury, uh, Joshua example. You are what it is. Fury's going to do him. Joshua's going to do him. You are allowed to like both. Yeah. Or you are allowed to watch a Frank Warren show and a, and a Eddie Hearn show. You are allowed to watch BT and Sky. You you can watch Boxing Social and IFL TV. That's a brilliant... There we go. You can. You, you can. can be a fan of Teb Nuts here. <laughs> and uh, 
dischance her. <laughs> I just stumbled upon the sport. But you can, but everyone's part of boxing is, it's like, no, yeah, AJ, oh, I'm Fury, oh, I'm this. You know, it, that's part of what it is. But you, it's not football. It's not like, right, you, are you a Joshua fan or are you a Fury fan? Most people are one or Which one are you? What, the Joshua or a Fury fan? I'm not a fan of any fighter. Actually, no, that's a lie. I'm not a fan of any UK fighter. I actually said this to George Groves um, when we interviewed, when we did the interview Sorry, Dave Wasserman. Allen. I'm not a fan of any fighter. Dave oh. is a dear friend of mine, but I'm, I'm not... I'm a fan of Dave Allen. Yeah, so that's fine. If Dave Allen's fighting Fury, I'm sorry, I'm coming out with the 316 t-shirt. <laughs> if Dave Allen's fighting Joshua, I'm coming out with the white rhino t-shirt. The thing is, like, what I'm trying to say is, is similar to what you've said, really, that I find it a lot easier if I'm not really a fan of anyone. And I think, like, the more I've kind of done in boxing, the less of a fan of specific fighters I am I think and what was the same with George Groves George was the last fighter that I was a fan of and he's now retired so I'm not a fan of, of anybody really I mean I love Vasil Lomachenko love Inoue um, but Eris Landy Lara Eris Landy we'll come on to this later um, yes my daughter is actually named after Eris Landy Lara um, Eris Landy Tebbut uh, interesting name but um, <laughs> <laughs> we've gone off track um, coming up next can we can we go and have a cigarette I don't smoke anymore. Have you stopped? I quit smoking. So have I. Coming up next, we've spoken about him already, Paulie Malinaji, who's going to be part of James the Gale's team, takes our 10 count this week where we ask him 10 questions and he gives us some answers. Check it out. Biggest influence? Uh, my uh, biggest boxing influence, uh, my favorite fighter growing up was Arturo Gatti. Uh, Similar uh, background, the Italian uh, family who moved him on North America to make a better living, and he became a fighter. Same thing with me. So, I always looked up to, looked up to Gotti as a kid. Favorite fighter growing up? My well, favorite fighter growing up was Gotti. You know, that was my biggest influence. You know, without him, uh, you know, I wouldn't have uh, uh, given so much thought about into boxing. You know, he was uh, he was a somebody that my family cheered for, my family rooted for. You know. Favorite fight. Favorite fight is probably one of the Gotti Ward fights or Meldrick Taylor versus Julio Cesar Chavez one. Best moment in boxing? Uh, winning two world titles, you know, um, you can probably, um, I, I can't really pick which one was better, you know, uh, they both were very positive moments for me um, in my career. Worst moment in boxing? Uh, worst moment in boxing, probably losing to Ricky Hatton, you know. Um, a lot of things didn't go right that night. A lot of things didn't go right in that camp. And, uh, you know, it's something I have to live with. Best friend in boxing? My best friend in boxing. Um, right now, my best friend as far as a fighter or is it just in a boxing business? Um, boxing business, um, I would say Chris Gilmore. He's uh, one of the producers behind the Showtime cameras. Also, I'm very good friends with James DeGill. Best you faced? Best fighter I face is Miguel Cotto, most complete fighter, hardest puncher, and a, and, a, and a very intelligent fighter. Hardest puncher? Miguel Cotto. Most skilled? Uh, most skilled, uh, most overall skills is Amir Khan. Uh, I mean, most overall skills is Miguel Cotto, but most difficult skills to deal with was Amir Khan. Best fighter in the world? Right now, the best fighter in the world is up in the air, but you know, I would say Vasil Lomachenko. But if he goes up too many weight classes, it could cost him. So that was the 10 count with former two weight world champion Paulie Malinaji. Back in the studio, we're joined by our new co host. Mr. Declan Warrington. How are you, Dick? Yeah, good. How are you, Rob? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Thanks for coming down here today. Thank um, you. Yeah, you're very welcome. I think Coogan was um, had a contractual amount of time that he could spend in boxing social right. office, so he had to go. Um, let's start with the heavyweights. You're mm. somebody who I always like to pick your brain when it comes to fights that have been announced or due to come up. We've recently seen Anthony Joshua versus Jarrell Miller confirmed mm. for Madison Square Garden on June the 1st. Talk to me about the fight. Um, well, at a risk of standing wise after the event, there's nothing surprising about it. It felt 
some, going sometime, but even when the official line was it's going to be white next, you could feel the wheels were in motion to transfer to to the US to fight Miller instead. Um, and on that note, I'm not as negative as a lot of people are about it because, I mean, I know we're going to come to this later, but it appeared Wilder and Fury were tied up, so he had to find someone else. And I was actually surprised they didn't do this last summer. He looked like a good move, marketing-wise, which is what Joshua needs in the US. He needed to fight a reasonably big name out there, which Miller will end up becoming because he'll sell the fight with the trash talk, etc. If he gets a knock knockout, he's made a, a statement of sorts out there. It builds his profile, and that can lead in the long term to, they would hope, negotiate, dominating negotiations against Wilder, against Fury, getting the big sale, and that's where the money will be. It's the long game. With Gerald Miller, I mean, a lot of people, as you say, are, are kind of certainly more negative than you appear to be about mm. the fight. Um, do you see it being a competitive fight? Do you see Gerald Miller potentially being able to cause an upset? Not really. I mean, the whole cliche is America, uh, it's heavyweight boxing, anything can happen, etc. I don't see anything like that. I don't think Miller's got the boxing ability to trouble Joshua. I don't think Joshua has to be at his best to win. The interesting question will be, and I'm saying this at a time, and obviously Fury's been talking about him supposedly putting Miller down seven times in sparring, and Fury's not a puncher, as we know. Um, is he big enough? Because he is a very big man, Miller. He could well have the p impressive punch resistance on the night. Joshua has that habit of headhunting at times. Maybe he could put in a, a, ta a perform performance similar to the one Takan put in against Joshua, go some rounds, but I don't see it being like that. I actually think it'll be one of Joshua's more routine victories, at least of those we've seen at world level. Yeah, I think for me, the, the kind of people are saying that, you know, if Jarrell Miller's got a chin, but he's not one for head movement. He's no. Not, he doesn't have particularly good footwork. I mean, he's like 300 pounds. Seems to me like he's going to have to take a lot of heavy lever to even get to a point where, I mean, a lot of people are pointing to the fact that Joshua doesn't necessarily have the best stamina or in certain fights he has shown a, a tendency mm. to kind of fade. Do you think that's the only way that Miller can win the fight? Kind of blocking punches with his face until Joshua eventually potentially runs out of steam? I wouldn't recommend he does that. And actually, no. frankly, I mean, those I've had questions about Joshua's stamina, etc. but... You've already said how Miller's feet aren't great, his head movement's not great, which makes him quite a stationary object, which means Joshua won't have to use that much energy on the night. He'll keep landing. It's when he throws a big punches and misses. That's when he's going to get tired. I don't see him tiring against Miller. If Miller has a sort of chin that he can take a lot of artillery from Joshua for seven, eight, nine rounds and ends up getting a late victory, he would have really would have earned it. Seems to me like a lot of fans, I mean, I, I work in social media, so I kind of get mm. to see the, the fallout, as it were, with posts people are not generally happy certainly the the, the hardcore quote-unquote boxing fraternity not thrilled about it being Gerald Miller not thrilled about it being in New York mm. do you think they've got a right to, to kind of feel that way about this fight yeah because it isn't it's not Wilder it's not Fury after that it's not Usyk it's not Dillian White when we were told for a long time it's going to be Dillian White we were told the fight's going to be at Wembley so people will feel like they've been misled over the fight particularly when Joshua made what now looks like a mistake when he joined Dillian White at ringside after White beat Chisora said to the crowd if it's not Wilder next it will be White it's now not Dillian White I don't think Dillian White is afraid of fighting an anti-Joshua mm. I think he would have taken that fight it looks like again behind the scenes things have been put into place to make it easier for Dillian White not to take the fight make it easier for Joshua to take the middle fight so I can I certainly can recognise the frustration but by the same token, I do think people quite often want too much instantly nowadays. That's not just in boxing, that's in general. You really do see that in social media. And actually, and again, things are getting so he messy in the heavyweight division now that it won't, it's unlikely to resolve itself as, as we'd like. But if you're looking from Joshua's perspective, the smart thing to do is to build your profile in the US against an opponent like Miller because the big money fight at least until Tyson Fury for his family in the work six months ago, was wilder. So what do you do? You make yourself as powerful as possible in the US because that is a big money fight so that you can try and dictate terms out there to make as much money as possible from that. And these are the stages you have to go through to do that. Lennox Lewis earned huge money fighting Evander Holyfield, for example, but he had to fight someone like Tony Tucker before mm -hmm. that. And he wasn't getting a load of criticism about that because back then there was more patience, more acceptance. Now, because everyone's got a voice, it kind of and people can get misled very easily. I, again, it might not be the fight people want, but I think people have been too harsh in their criticism. And one thing I will say about Joshua, all the criticism he's getting, I think should be directed at those around him because he is not afraid of anyone. Maybe he should be, maybe there are fights he would lose, but Joshua would 100% believe he can beat any fighter out there. He would fight anyone. 
just final word on, on kind of Joshua and the, it seems to me like obviously British boxing had somewhat of a boom particularly the heavyweights mm. I mean you look at the top 10 rankings it's kind of stacked full of British fighters yeah. but in recent years kind of the whether it's a misconception or not but the idea of Britain being kind of the epicenter of heavyweight boxing you're now seeing obviously Tyson Fury went over to, to LA to box Wilder now Joshua's going back over there with ESPN Plus with the yeah. zone do you think the shift is now going back to America which has kind of conventionally been the heavyweight home I don't think the shift had ever actually truly left the okay. US to be honest there were certain circumstances jo- Joshua Klitschko being a great one where that fight was obvious in the UK but overall the even when these fights are st- still taking place, when we're having these big occasions, Frotch Groves in London at Wembley, for example, the big fights during those era, that era was still Mayweather Pacquiao. Around the time of Joshua Klitschko, you ended up having Mayweather McGregor because the US market dictated it, basically. That's where the great best money is. You mentioned those fights. We've got Amir Khan and Terence Crawford yep. going back out there now. So in the coming months, it's highly likely our three biggest active names, Joshua, Fury, and Amir Khan, are going to be fighting in the US. And the reason for that is, is because there is a big market out there. And... I don't see that changing anytime soon. That's something that I actually spoke to Ben Davison about fairly recently with kind of even even though Joshua's going to be boxing on the zone, which is subscription based and the ESPN mm. Plus is subscription based, you've still got pay-per-view out in America is still three, four times the size of uh, of the UK pay-per-view. So that, again, points to the fact that that's kind of the episode. If you want to be making money, you're going to have to go to America, right? Yeah, and I think there's more loyalty from the British fans, which is something they deserve recognition for, by the way. British fans are far likelier to stay up and watch a fight in the early hours than Amer- American ones would be, I suspect, if they were asked to do the same thing. And also, the Americans get charged a lot more for pay-per-view mm. than we do. A lot more. So again, all right, even if you sell more, even if more people over here are interested in watching the fights, you still get more money out of the US. Okay, well, we also recently had some news in the heavyweight division. Derek Chisora is linked up with Dave Colwell, who I was lucky enough to speak to on the phone recently. Check out what he said. This is Rob Temple for Boxing Social. Delighted to be joined on the phone by Dave Caldwell, the new trainer of Derek Chisora. How are you doing, Dave? I'm all right, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Very well. Appreciate your time on the way to football, so I'll make it quick. Um, talk to me about the link-up with Derek Chisora. It took a lot of people, myself included, by surprise. Yeah, it took, took myself by surprise, really, when uh, when I looked at my phone one, one evening and, and it was Dave A on the phone. Um... I remember saying to my wife, look, I showed her the screen, I went, eh, David is calling. I, I just didn't know why. Um, went upstairs and answered the phone and, uh, yeah, we, we had a bit of a chat and then he said, um, basically, he wanted me to coach Derek. And uh, I was as taken aback as anybody on anybody that's seen this press release. So, David just randomly contacted you. Was this the, when was the time that you spoke to him before that? Because, obviously, you had your kind of... I think it's fair to say your differences in the build-up to both Tony Bellew fights. Had you spoken to him intermittently since then? Yeah, we've spoken since. I mean, I'll be honest with you. After he was uh, after the injury in the first fight, um, I did I did uh, drop him a, a message on 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 his Instagram just to say, look, hope you re- hope you recover well. Um, uh, you know, wish you all the best. Because end of the day, you know, it's it's. I've got a heart. You don't want to see people, you know, at the lowest. Um, and yeah, it was just a just a brief, you know. Hope 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 you recover and hope you do well. Um, and you know, since then, since the second fight, um, we've, we've got a common interest in in our sons. Both, you know, we've both got kids that are, are very athletic and very sporty. Um, his little boy Cassius, who I knew from when the haymaker days, I always kept an eye on him and on, on his stories. He's, you know, he's, he's a footballer, but he's a fantastic tennis player, and he competes at tennis. Whereas, obviously, my my son competes at football. So we've we've kind of like messaged each other as 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 dads about as kids, but nothing boxing related. Um, the only time that we've really spoke, we, we was at a, both at a boxing show. I can't get who was fighting one of Eddie's shows, and we were both sat. Uh, ringside in, in the sky seats and it was the most we've ever spoke ever um, you know even went back to the haymaker days it was the most we've ever spoke um, we had a really good chat uh, and again it was just it was just about um, about uh, just the fights in general and, and things like that and nothing nothing specific but that was a long time ago and, and this was you know this was out of the blue um, so yeah it was kind of my surprise now the last time I spoke to you was after the Cheeseman fight, um, when you were talking about the fact that, you know, you, as all trainers do, particularly people who take fighters on the pads, 
you get your injuries, you kind of wear and tear your yeah. elbows, your shoulder, your neck and your back. <laughs> yeah. You told me that you're not really looking at taking any big man. Why Why take no. Derek Chisora? I mean, I assume he's going to hit a lot harder on the pads than, you know, Jamie yeah. McDonald. Yeah, yeah. Um, the thing is, is, it's the same as anybody. I don't, I've never asked anybody to, 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 to come to my gym. I've never asked to train anybody. And I never will. Um, the thing is, is, it's same with Fowler, same with Jordan, same with, with Tony, you know, same with them all. Um, if you, if I like you and if I see you as a, as a friend and you're asking me for my help, then, you know, um, if it's worth, you know, if it's worth my while and if it's, if it's something that I think is going to gel and I can work with, then I'm, you know, I, I, yeah, if it, if it suits, then I will. I'll, and and Derek, I got to know since obviously working with Tony. Derek's a good mate of his of, of Tony's. I've got to know Derek over the years. Um, I know he's got a lot of respect for me when we, when he spoke before. And um, yeah, I, I like Del. And um, I just you know, is it a stage of his career? He's not. You know, he's, he's, you're not talking about a four or five year project. Um, you know, and so. I thought, well, yeah, let's let's give it a go. We had one session as a as a trial sort of thing. I had a good good session, and I thought, you know what? Yeah, I can I can work with this fella. Um, and you know, we've had a week now, and and it's been a good. He's, he's a great character. He's actually funny. Um, he's he's very coachable, which is the main thing. Um, and uh, yeah, we've. It's been a good week, and and I'm quite excited by the prospect. He's still got he's still got a lot. To I appreciate you've just said that David's going to be the one who takes charge of the fights and stuff. But when can we realistically expect to see him in the ring? There's been talk of Joseph Parker. I actually spoke to Kevin Barry not long ago, and he said that that's a potential fight they're looking at. Yep. Yep. So that that is a. I mean, you know yourself, that is a potential um, potential avenue that they're looking at. Um, it's down to David and, and uh, David, Eddie, and, and Kevin Barry to, to sort all that out. Um, uh, you know, whether if it gets done, it gets done. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Then they'll look at another avenue. But you know, that is a potential um, prospect of a fight, and we'll uh, we'll see. What did you make of his performance against Dillian White? Oh, I thought he did really well. I thought he did really well. Um, it was, you know, listen, I rate Dillian. Um, you talk, you're not talking about a guy that's just a, you know, a, a decent fighter. You're talking about one of the top top heavyweights in the world, and uh, he gave him a hell of a fight. And um, he, he just, I think, you know, when, when he lost those points, I think he, he, he panicked a little bit, started throwing things when he didn't need to, and, and trying a little bit too hard. And uh, and yeah, and then he walked onto an almighty left hook, which is heavyweight boxing. You know, heavyweight boxing, you're only ever one shot away from getting the lights put out. One thing I did want to talk to you about when you took. David Price, you were talking about kind yeah. of dropping him down a little bit, uh, not dropping him down, the opposite, bringing his weight up. Um, one thing that I thought... No, no, I never, I never, I never said that about Price's weight. All right, Price okay. was the one that wanted... Price came, when Price first started back training, he said he was 24 stone. He came down to 20 stone when he fought with me. Um, and it was Price that was the one that said that he felt comfortable that way. He felt safer that way. He said he absorbed shots better that way. And I had nothing to do with what, what he wanted to weigh. That was his, that was his, how he felt comfortable. Now, when you're fight, dealing with a fighter that's got no confidence, you can't then say, oh, no, I think you should go back down to the lighter weight because he felt that he, he was getting, you know, when he got knocked out, he was 17 and a half, 18 stone or whatever it was. He felt safer and sturdier at 20 stone. So, you know, 19, 20 stone, that's the weight that he wanted to box at. That that wasn't me bringing him heavier. All right, okay. Well, stand corrected. Um, people seem, people seem, people seem to think that. Mm. Um, and I got a lot of shit about his weight, but that's that's what that was his choice. Right. So you know, I'm not, I'm not taking no rap for for that way. <laughs> okay, you you you've absolved yourself of that one. I was where I was going with that, Dave. Is um. Personally, I felt that Derek may have been too light against Dillian White. I thought that he was potentially starting to show signs of feeling the shots a little bit, which can happen yeah. when you drop down in do weight. So is that kind of something that yeah. you're looking to visit? Well, do you know the thing is, <laughs> that was my worry before the fight. Yeah, was, same. Was the weight-wise, would he, you know, would he absorb that? I just wondered, would he absorb the shots as well? But it's a, you know, it's a catch-22 because he looks more active, um... Uh, at, at the lighter weight, he looked in better shape at the lighter weight, and he was able to do more. Um, whether whether that had a bearing on on taking the shots, I'm not so sure. Maybe it's a case of just just you know, uh, sometimes when you drop down a weight, you need a couple of fights um, or at least one fight to to get used to it. Um, you know, um, 
so I don't, I, I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, that's something that you know we'll talk with, we'll we'll talk with uh, with David and 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 the S and C S and C team about that and see what see what they think. But you know, it, it, you know, there's no excuse you can't say about his weight. Um, uh, it is what it is, really. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Okay. Well, just finally, because I know you're very, um, your time is very precious at the minute. I do appreciate you talking to me. Um, next weekend we've got James DeGale versus Chris Eubank Jr. Just final thoughts on that, really. Um, do you know what? It's a tough. It's a tough fight. Um, it's a tough fight for James because I feel at this stage of his career, is uh, is not. He's not been performing how he used to do. Uh, I don't know if that's because he's a little bit, um, I swear, uh, because he's a little bit maybe on the on the slide, or I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. I don't know if it's because if he if he wasn't getting up for those fights. I know he's up for this fight as long as he chooses the boxing. He doesn't fight with his with his heart, which he has been doing. Um, then you know, uh, I think he's. I think he's got a, a, every chance, and I and I would tip him to outbox him. But if he stands and has a fight with Eubank, Eubank's phenomenally strong and and you know and and ferocious. Um, and so you know, if he stands and fights with him, then he's he's in trouble. Okay. Well, can I push you for a prediction? I'm going to go with James on on, on points. I think he's going to be smart. I think, I think because he has to be smart and he knows he has to be smart. Um, so I'm going to go with James with, with, with points in a really, really good fight. Okay. Well, Dave Caldwell, thanks very much for speaking to Boxing Social. Appreciate your time. Um, off with you and I will see you soon. Thanks, mate. Cheers. Cheers, Dave. Bye. Thanks, mate. Bye. So that was Dave Caldwell talking about his recent link up with Derek Chisora. What did you make of that, Declan? Took a lot of people by surprise. <laughs> yeah, to me, so by surprise, didn't see it coming. But then I didn't see Chisora linking up with David Hay coming either. Probably beyond the point of trying to predict anything <laughs> related to Chisora. That does concern me. Don't get me wrong. David Colwell is a very good trainer. Chisora has been a very good fighter. But it concerns me because I believe after that loss to White, it was a horrible knockout. And Chisora has had some big, heavy losses now. And he's at the point where it's difficult to see him getting in a position where he's going to earn really good money from a fight. He's becoming an opponent. If you're bothering getting a new trainer, that suggests you're not looking at the end game anytime mm. soon. You're looking to reinvent yourself to some sort of extent. And also, I think it's really harsh on Don Charles, who I think's done brilliantly for Chisora. Chisora surpassed my expectations at a past fight, performed better than I expected he would. Um, and if you go back to the start of Chisora's career, when we look at him, I don't know, beating up Danny Williams, okay, mm. he looked promising, but we did not think he'd become the sort of fighter who would enhance his reputation against Vitaly Klitschko, we'd earn the good money he did against David Hay, for example. That is a fighter who, if you look back then, probably has surpassed expectations, and therefore, if your one trainer has led to you or contributed to surpassing expectations, why would you change him? You know, Ch Charles hasn't done Chisel or any harm whatsoever, um, and I think that's been a strength, and actually, when he didn't work with Charles was when he had some of his worst performances as well. Yeah, so Ajit Kabyle fight. That would concern me, and that's not a reflection on Cole, where it just things seem to work rightly there. So again, if Cole had been working in the start of his career, I'm sure he'd be, be every bit as good a fighter. Um, but harsh on Charles, and again, I Chisora is not someone I want to see fighting on for much longer. So I wish he had retired after White. So um, yeah, I'm not over the moon about it. Yeah, I think with Don Charles as well, I think it's it's no secret that Derek Chisora has his ups and downs from a mental point of view. Mm. Don Charles seems to have been somebody who's is able to rein him in and, and kind yeah. of keep him focused where possible throughout his career. Something I think that's going to be, I mean, with no disrespect to Dave Caldwell, you don't know how that's going to pan out, but certainly from looking back at Derek's career, something that you would assume he's going to miss going forward. Yeah, and because he's such an enigmatic individual as well as fighter, you don't know what... I remember speaking to Don Charles about this. It was before the um, the first Dillian White fight when he put in a really good performance. Now, I had that fight a draw. White got it got the victory on the night but actually I thought if anyone deserved a victory it was probably Chisora to my mind um, but Don was telling me showed up on the night and obviously he didn't say this but Chisora was in a position in his career then if that night hadn't got well for him and I know he lost but he, it didn't do his reputation any harm because mm. he was in such an entertaining fight he would have had very few options then which you could argue is the case now Don said he'd got into the change room and he just knew right tonight's going to be a good night Derek's on it he needs someone like that I believe who knows him and there was that unlucky friendship between Bellew and Chisora mm. which 
I suspect has contributed to Dave Colwood linking up with him so maybe he knows him a lot better than we realise um, it may be it energises him refreshes him changes scenery etc that can be good for a fighter but like you say Don Charles really knows him and despite him losing fights that wasn't because he was underperforming he didn't underperform against Dillian White no. that was just Dillian White being younger fresher etc really um, so I don't really see what a new trainer can realistically do for, for Derek. Now, it's something that I spoke to Dave about in the interview, it's something that we actually, because we actually watched the um, the White Chisora rematch together mm. at the O2. Um, one thing that was quite apparent to me throughout the week, while Derek looked fantastic on the scale, yeah. obviously working with Ruben Tavares and David Hay, he looked body beautiful, but didn't seem to be holding the shots as well. I mean, yeah, he got hurt absolutely. badly in yeah. the first round by Dillian White and seemed to be getting hit and hurt throughout the fight before mm. inevitably being knocked out. Now, Dave Caldwell said that he agrees with that and it's something that he wants to revisit going forward. Is that something you'd agree with? Yeah, I do. I do. Um, I mean, going back to that night, you could see in the you know first couple of rounds, he took some shots and he took, and you could tell he felt them. And even at that point, you thought, right, the knockout's an inevitability. And it was a surprise it actually took as long as it did. But that has always been one of Chisora's strengths to punch resistance he mm. hasn't had this masterful defence where he can avoid taking punishment so he's always had to be able to absorb it he's got that good engine so he needs to be able to last so he can start to impose that engine on his opponents but then you kind of as looked to be the case before in the lead up to that fight against White and when you saw him like that it made you question things a little bit is there an element of too many chefs boiling in a broth around mm. Chisora at the moment this is the sort of thing if he was going to do it realistically he should have been doing far earlier on in his career he's gone in one direction for so long now I don't think you can risk taking it back the other way mm. and it doesn't sound like Caldwell's going to be doing that but it, it, they were so positive about his performance that night you suspect Chisora would want to cling on to at least some of that so mm. it does look it looks messy put it that way it looks borderline chaotic it's albeit also, from the outside sure I mean I mean, Dave said in the interview that he, him and David Hay are now have put the infamous Penfold yeah. etc behind them um, but again it's kind of as you say you've got combustible elements in David Hay and Derek Chisora you've got the history with Dave Caldwell for somebody who isn't historically very level headed in mm. Derek Chisora again opening himself up to kind of a potential situation now it didn't look like that in the build up to the white fight mm. even though you had I mean Don Charles and David Hay had their own their own history yeah. but Again, as you say, coming to the end of his career, is it really what he needs at this point? No, I don't believe it is, but there is a saving grace there in that if Chisora is based up in Rotherham, which I suspect, I don't think Hay will be as hands-on mm. as he was when he was training under Lon in London under Don Charles. So that might be one influence that he could perhaps do without, which isn't to criticise David Hay in any way, shape or form, but I've just strongly believed you should have one voice in your corner or have one approach. And you shouldn't be... Mm. Mess you, you don't want to get caught between two stools. David Hay trying to turn him into a, a Hay-esque fighter to oversimplify it. Caldwell trying to get him to be the best Chisora and he become neither one or the other. A great example of that was Ricky Hatton against Manny Pacquiao. Yeah. Um, looked really against, forward, good yeah. against Malinaji, but that was only after he'd been taken slightly away from what Billy Graham, who'd mm. done brilliantly with him, had been doing. By the time he'd done another training camp with Floyd Mayweather Sr., had been working with him for even longer, he didn't become the fighter Maybe seeing him was talking about him becoming but he certainly had lost so many of those traits that made Hatton such a strong fighter and he was just a rabbit in headlights completely exposed not, not doing either one or the other and no, had a really between. devastating night just final word on Derek Chisora there's been a lot of talk about him potentially fighting Joseph Parker no. um, last time we saw Joseph Parker over here was against a mutual opponent in Dillian White does that fight appeal to you at all? considering um, the fact that you did just say that you, yeah. you prefer um, to see Derek retire but. well he's certainly Chisora's an opponent again mm. um, look I, I've got Parker predictions wrong before I thought Parker was going to lose against Dillian White and I think I still think he's quite a talented fighter particularly if the hunger's there he's a good opponent for Parker because the market isn't there in New Zealand he's probably quite popular over here now having mm. been in an entertaining fight against White he's a very likeable individual so if he gets a win there, it's an entertaining win. Doesn't do any, him any harm. Similarly, Park has that reputation, has that profile. If Chisora wins, it's a good opportunity for him. He can good opportunity for him to rebuild, move into another big fight. Moving on to Dillian White, the man in the other corner, as it were. Um, something that I've spoken to you about on numerous occasions is mm. kind of the progression of Dillian White as as a fighter. Yeah. Could never really have seen him become what he has become. That's no disrespect to Dillian White. Um, no, I agree. Yeah. But he has become. I mean, a, a, an A-side pay-per-view fighter, as he showed against Joseph Parker, 
terrific career progression from him. Mm. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. I can't tell you how much I admire him. And I really admired him when he was first coming onto the scene, by the way, particularly after that Joshua fight, because just the punch resistance he showed, the fearlessness, the gut. I mean, those are traits you don't often see at in the heavyweight division to that extent. And he, he really showed them. And you kind of thought, why it's just going to be fun for as long as he's around. But for a long time after that, he looked fringe European level at best. He made that fight against Parker, where I thought Parker's just too good for you. Unfortunately, he's a superior boxer. And what surprised me was that not only did White win, he won in what wasn't actually a brawl. There were elements of brawling, but White showed better boxing ability than yeah. we've ever seen. We've been talking about trainers recently. Mark Tibbs has done a brilliant job with, with Dylan White because, again, he's completely different from the fighter we thought he'd become, already a better fighter than we thought he'd become. And, again, the fact he's been squeezed out in the heavyweight scene a little bit probably hints at the fact a few fighters are looking at him. Don't get me wrong, I think all three champions will beat him. But all three fighters are looking at him thinking there are much easier fights out there than Diddy and White. If Joshua got drawn into another slugfest against White, that could go wrong. I don't think it would. I think it would. Likewise with White. Um, sorry, likewise with Wilder. So, I, we're talking about the top three heavyweights in the world. If they're not to fight each other, my favourite opponent for all of them would probably be Usyk. After that, it would be White. And he's earning really good money now and it probably won't be long before if he's sensible things he could actually look at retiring. Not that he should. It's also, you make an interesting point, with him kind of being knocking on the door, he's had the position with the WBC mm. for a long time, It's he's been in a position where he's not getting the champions, he's not getting yeah. the quote-unquote marquee fights, but he, in the same vein, he's not choosing to, to fight stiffs, and he's not choosing yeah. to take easy opponents, I means box Joseph Parker, obviously the Chisora rematch didn't necessarily need to take that fight. Um, he's kind of benefited a little bit from being on the outside and getting these these step-up fights at good points yeah, in his absolutely. career, and has, and has indeed improved Good learning through fights, those fights yeah, yeah absolutely um, coming up potentially the Brazil fight that's been ordered for the interim title um, by Mauricio Suleiman mm. who will be coming up later on the show what do you make of that fight if indeed it does take place we've had all of this um, which will again come on to the kind of Wilder Fury um, debacle uh, which I know you're thrilled about talk to me about a potential and it, I do stress potential Dillian White versus Dominic Brazil fight well, can we just put the interim title to one side because yeah. no one needs that um in isolation, actually quite a good fight. And again, it probably put it in the same category as Joshua Miller insofar as it's not a bad fight, but people were likely to be disappointed by it because it's not the one they were expecting. This is could well be a fight between the fighters with the two best chins in the heavyweight mm. division. If it come, becomes a brawl, that could be really entertaining. Not that I think White should make it a brawl because as he showed against Parker, he didn't show against Jizora. There is better boxing ability mm. there than we thought. This could be good for White because particularly as a if the heavyweight division is going as we now expect it to, it might not be that long before Wilder is looking for an opponent. If he gets a win against Brazil, assuming Wilder doesn't fight Brazil first, then he's enhanced his reputation in the US. He's suddenly a likelier opponent out there for him. And White is a fighter who's approaching his prime now, needs to be in these fights, earning good money. The shame with it is, and it kind of captures his career in a lot of ways, that he has been the one going off to the side and potentially again he's looking at a rather thankless fight against Brazil which okay we'll earn decent money for it but he won't earn great money for it and it's another one he will be expected to win Brazil's not a fighter everyone's desperate to fight for a reason mm. because he's actually quite tough it's a handful yes. that fight with Isa Raguna was one of, the, yes. that, one of the most entertaining heavyweight fights of recent times he's a tough fighter yeah. but and so again probably not similarly, dissimilarly to what I was saying about Chisora White um, with Parker you could come out of that fight not looking great about it and actually end up further away from the fight you're hoping to present yourself as than, uh, than going into it. Now, one thing with Dillian White that's become apparent recently with very public protracted negotiations for a potential Joshua White rematch mm. is that he has built himself into, as we mentioned earlier, kind of an A-side pay-per-view fighter. How do you think that dynamic plays out with Eddie Hearn? Obviously, Eddie has, has, has kind of built him and given yeah. him this platform and now it's, well, it certainly seems that it's made fights more difficult to make because now Dillian White has a has a sense of worth and sense of what he's entitled yeah. to uh, well there's certainly a strange relationship there. There's, that's no secret um, I think Dillian's actually been quite unlucky there and you could argue so as Eddie in within the context of that relationship because Eddie was building him at a time when Joshua was a priority so you're looking at other opponents for White and I don't think White would have been under any illusions he's, he's, he's a bright man he would have known Eddie's sees him he's most valuable to Eddie as a future opponent for Joshua but at some point in the process of him 
working with white the whole design element came into it and then eddie has to start looking at the u.s market mm. he's he's juggling a lot more and he has greater priorities and sunny white has become a victim of that by mm. the looks of things but but again he's kind of sorry things right but in, no, in his own in his own way dillian has again kind of used that to his advantage his last fight was on showtime yeah the brazil fight if it does take place will likely head to showtime so it's kind of dillian as you said being an intelligent man kind of known his worth and being that kind of opportunistic fighter slash businessman and getting his his name out there in yeah. a big fight so it's again something to be commended for absolutely absolutely to be commended because again he hasn't taken easy fights they have been there's been some very losable fights mm. and it, indeed some like against Hellenius where he was on an undercard against an opponent he was unlikely to ever entertain against mm. he took these fights because he was backing himself to push his well the Parker fight looked the riskiest one because and indeed after Parker when um in the post-fight press conference, I remember him saying, no, I want another fight before Joshua because he wasn't just trying to cash in against Joshua. He was trying to be as developed and prepared as possible to give himself the best possible chance on a night, on a night against Joshua. And he's getting the rewards for having the right attitude, essentially. So, no, Didion White deserves all the credit he's getting. But the problem is, he's now at that point where he looks like he's reaching his ceiling because of the way Frank Warren, ESPN... BTF, Fury in One Direction, Wilder, Showtime, so forth, Eddie with DAZN and Joshua. He now needs one of them to come to him unless he forces a mandatory, which that's way he, where he's likely to go with um, with Brazil. Yeah. But he kind of he's earned his shot before now, and it's a shame he's now had to almost take a step back. It would certainly indicate going that route. And I don't know the, mm. the Brazil fight, Dillian's been very vocal about that. That was the fight because there's also been the Povetkin fight was rumoured. Yeah, another fight would fight anyone. Yeah, then, sure, yeah. exactly. Um, but it, it kind of looks as if that he's gone that route to try and potentially chase down a, a, a wilder fight. The Joshua fight will always be there kind of regardless mm. of what happens. So I think he's kind of hedging his bets in that regard. If it's not Brazil... Um, and again, this is this is a difficult question, or a certainly more difficult yeah. question, given the the news today with um, ESPN top rank and Tyson Fury. But who would you like to see Dillian White fight if it's not Dominic Brazil? Well, I can tell you before it was looking like it was going to be Brazil that Povetkin was certainly the likeliest opponent, and I actually think he's better off fighting Brazil than Povetkin because that would have been a really good fight. Don't get me wrong, but that's a dangerous one. That's a risky fight, and we've looked at White quite a few times now and he's gone into fights where again he's consistently proven us wrong but you at least thought you could lose this even if you didn't think he was going to lose this and I think boxing is a sort of sport particularly heavyweight boxing there's only so many times you can roll the dice and actually not be undermined at some point so I think he is I would rather if I was looking after the DMY I'd rather he ended up fighting Brazil than um, than Usyk sorry than Okay, well, coming up next, I was lucky enough to speak to WBC President Mauricio Suleiman once again on all things White Brazil, Wilder Fury 2, and the WBC Clean Boxing Program. Check it out. This is Rob Tubber for Boxing Social. I'm delighted to be joined here on the phone by Mauricio Suleiman, the president of the WBC. Mauricio, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. I'm doing great here in Mexico City right now. Great, fantastic. I'm just going to get straight down to business, Mauricio. Um, recently, we've been greeted with the news that the WBC have ordered Dillian White versus Dominic Brazil for the WBC interim heavyweight title. Just tell me a little bit about the process of that fight being made. Sure. Uh, the WBC uh, has you know, we have a rule which is a situation regarding the mandatory contender and the mandatory defenses by each champion which has to be once per year. When uh, Wilder uh, fought Steven in that same card, Brazil won the final elimination bout, became mandatory challenger. Throughout last year, in 2018, the WBC had as a priority to try its best efforts to have Wilder Joshua become a reality. And for several months, there was an ongoing negotiation for that fight. And Brazil accepted the fact that the WBC would support such fight. At the end of the year, it did not come to fruition and Wilder was scheduled to fight Fury. And the WBC supported that, same as Brazil. It was such a great contest. 
uh, with bringing great attention to the heavyweight division, so the WBC again uh, got the support from Brazil to have a rematch. In order to keep the division active, in order to keep the rights of Brazil as mandatory contender, and because the champion is busy on another commitment, the WBC ordered an interim championship to give activity to the mandatory contender and the highest ranked fighter, who is Dylan White, who is the WBC uh, silver champion and has been very active and has expressed countless times that his only dream is to capture the green belt. Why, if you don't mind me asking, is there a need for an interim title? Um, usually an interim belt is reserved for if a fighter, so well, a champion is injured or having a foreseeable break from the ring. It's not generally considered to, to be the proper thing if, if a fighter is merely tied up. Why, why did Dillian White and Dominic Brazil need to fight for an interim title? The fact is that when the champion is not available to fulfill the mandatory obligation, it is most of the time is due to medical reasons or an injury, but we also have the provision for contractual reasons or for sports reasons. As I explained, it is not the fault of Rossell or Gillian White that while they're has been active fighting very important fights, like if it was Ortiz or Tyson Fury. The public wants to see a rematch, so the WBC supported a rematch. This is good for the sport, and we are giving both Brazil and White the opportunity to contest for an interim championship to eventually fight for the WBC full championship. We view this as an exemption. We don't do this in every division. We only do it when there is reason that we find to give activity to the division and to the fighters that have been waiting for a prolonged time, a period of time. Okay, well, we'll come on to Wilder Fury 2 or potentially the Wilder Fury rematch in a moment. Um, just final word on Dominic Brazil versus Dillian White. Does the winner of that fight absolutely have to fight for the full version of the WBC title in their next fight? You know, I never speculate. And it would be irresponsible to give a, a response like this the rule says that the interim champion fights the champion. Uh, there is always possibility of even the interim champion wanting to have another fight. So the interim champion becomes the mandatory contender of the division. And when the specific, when there's an interim champion, we wait until there's an interim champion. And then when the champion has also had his, his uh, commitment fulfilled, then that's when we proceed with the order in the fight. I've just been to a press conference today, Mauricio, where Tyson Fury and Frank Warren revealed that Tyson Fury is now co-promoted by Top Rank and has an exclusive deal with ESPN+. Plus. Now, in a lot of people's eyes, that throws up quite the obstacle from a television broadcast perspective of making Deontay Wilder versus Tyson Fury 2. Do you see that? Well, uh, I, I am not uh, certain. The WBC, uh, in difference with other sports, the organization is not involved in the business side of the sport. We're involved in the medical and the administration and uh, everything that has to do with the running of the sport by itself. Of course, uh, the negotiations that were ongoing throughout January and this part of February were uh, communicated to the WBC by both sides that everything was uh, moving smoothly in good in good uh, uh, 
uh, good faith negotiations between the parties, and that's why both requested additional time to finalize the agreement. Today's news, of course, comes in as a new uh, player that uh, could interfere with those negotiations, but that is up to the parties. I'm going to contact them today uh, to understand the status of the negotiations that they have been communicating to the WBC and then assess the situation uh, regarding this matter. What is the latest on the negotiations as you understand it? I appreciate you've got to make the phone call today, but what was the last you heard with regards to negotiations for Deontay Wilder versus Tyson Fury? The last communication I had was Friday. So today, starting the day, was uh, news. So we're going to go through the protocol and, and have the communication with both sides and understand what is the position of both, and then uh, I will inform the WBC Board of Governors of the specific situation, uh, and then move on uh, with whatever has to be done. What would happen in the event of, if that fight doesn't happen, now it's been ordered by the WBC, what would then happen? Would Deontay Wilder have to relinquish his title? Would he then have to fight either one of Dominic Brazil or, or Dillian White? What would happen if, for whatever reason, Deontay Wilder and Tyson Fury cannot come to terms? Would the purse bid still be called? No, I mean, if it, it all depends. Maybe one of the fighters would draw. Um, I, as I mentioned before, I do not like to speculate because any comment that I do could be considered as a official position. The WBC is clear. We are waiting for them to come into agreement. If they do not reach an agreement, then we have to understand if both fighters are willing to take the fight or not. Then we have to uh, rule according to the specific of what is today. So anything that I say could be misinterpreted. What I'm going to do, I'm going to come to both sides and then have the specific uh, position of both in order to continue with the WBC uh, administration of the heavyweight division. I appreciate that. Final word on potential Wilder Fury rematch. Would the winner of that fight, in your opinion, would they be, obviously they'd have a mandatory challenger, but would you be willing to, in future, grant an exemption for them to potentially unify the division against the winner of Anthony Joshua versus Jarrell Miller? That's a possibility. As I say, uh, and I repeat once again, uh, I do not speculate. The rules are clear, and the exemptions to the rules are clear. And the world has been waiting for a great fight uh, between the champions, which we are supporting as well. But at this time, we're concentrating in the two fights that the Dolby has control. The rematch between Wilder and Fury and the WBC Interim Championship between Brazil and White. Final question, Mauricio. Jarrell Miller was ranked with the WBC. Um, he was then removed from the rankings due to not complying with the WBC clean boxing program. Can you confirm whether or not he is indeed, um, if you're willing to rank him, has he joined up by the WBC clean boxing program as it stands? Yes, uh, he was uh, contacted in two separate occasions uh, and he did not enroll in the team boxing problem, program for whatever reason. So our guidelines, our rules say that uh, we cannot rank a fighter who is not enrolled, and that is what happened with Miller. So that was WBC President Mauricio Suleiman with some interesting points there about the WBC interim title. Uh, you're not a fan of interim titles, Deck. Um, are you? <laughs> no, we've already got too many as it is. Yeah. Uh, WBC aren't the worst offenders. WBA are by some distance. But look, going back to White Brazil, for example, it's a good fight as it is. It doesn't need that to be sold. And everyone knows there's the likelihood that the winner of that is really in line to fight Wilder or indeed whoever else the WBC champion might be when when their turn comes. So what's the interim title doing there if not just the WBC shamelessly promoting themselves as mm. we've known them to do? Yeah, and it's um, sanction fees as well, yep. which is, is another big issue in the sport. The more belts, the more sanction fees. Mm. And the more people pay the sanction fees, the more belts continue yeah. to crop up. Um, 
obviously takes us nicely into where we've been today. Um, the Tyson Fury mm. shock announcement with Top Rank and ESPN, which, in my opinion, and I know you feel very similarly, kind of looks like the end of Wilder Fury 2, certainly anytime soon. Um, just your thoughts on that announcement. Yeah, um, what you say, it looks like the end of it, doesn't it? It's very difficult not to come away from that being anything other than really pessimistic about the odds of that fight getting made next and really frustrated about it, about the timing of it when we're on the heavyweight boxing just had this, albeit mini revival, I say mini because it hasn't been prolonged in any way, mm. but it's had this great impact. We had the Joshua Klitschko fight, which everyone loved. Fury's got this great human story. He's come back, lots of publicity going into the Wilder fight, and one I thought he'd lose. I think a lot of people probably thought yep. he'd lose. How could he come back after living as he had the previous three years, only had two fights, have any hope of winning a fight like that? Now he boxed beautifully on the night in a really entertaining fight, which again, I did not think it was going to be anywhere near as entertaining as that. Gets everyone's attention. The one fight in the world I think most people wanted to see now was Wilder Fury, the rematch, because it was so entertaining first time around. It needs to be settled particularly after the way the first fight was and the timing of it that, that's what makes the timing so, so frustrating because Fury effectively already had the world at his feet um, I don't see how you could watch that first fight and not make Fury a significant favourite for the rematch so why are you doing what appears to be a really pragmatic move almost like they had not confident they would win the rematch which I I don't think is the case at all I'm I'm convinced Certainly they believe they would sure. think they would win a, win a rematch. So why take this deal now? Why not win the WBC title, win another hopefully entertaining fight against Wilder when you really will truly hold all the keys, have even greater bargaining power and right, work with ESPN then, have they um, get even more money out of them? Because that's what it comes down to, it is about money. We're talking about a fight who, when he first came out, when he first fought, fought Wilder, he thought, right, you're cashing in now can't really blame you in fairness given the past three years you can't really realistically hope to be the fight you were but he again he proved that all wrong and the timing of it was just brilliant not of this deal the timing of that fight was brilliant for Wilder because it completely disrupted any plans for jo around Joshua for what Eddie Hearn it appeared Eddie hadn't wanted to make the fight with Wilder partly because he wanted to make sure he held all the keys and negotiating with that so that they would get the lion's share of the money and you cannot blame them for that at all that's what you should be doing on Joshua's behalf that's a smart move while the, uh, sorry Fury coming back when the talk and the logical talk by the way was of him having five or six fights warm up fights tune ups before he takes anything dangerous meant they appeared to be quite safe in doing that Fury completely screwed that up for everyone admirably by the way that's not a criticism had that really entertaining fight took a lot of the momentum away from Joshua and at a time when everyone's criticising Joshua again I think unfairly for not fighting one of the other champions and is now accusing him of ducking people and the subtext of a lot of that is look at Tyson Fury he's not ducking anyone look how entertaining he is he's given us the fights we want they've now kind of taken a step back and mm -hmm. gone down the route which they were enjoying by the way and the narrative they're enhancing with a lot of their a lot of things they were saying in public, a lot of things that going out over social media, almost replicating the things that people were criticising Joshua for. It, it makes well, it, does, it, it makes a lot of sense, sadly, because it's it about money. Yeah, sense. it makes a lot of business sense. So I completely understand it. But for someone who really wanted to see the fight, really wanted to see that fight, thought we were as close to it as we are. Um, and again, particularly a time of it when boxing is getting more widespread popularity when a lot of more casual fans are interested in a fight like this to disappoint people now just feels so costly but saying that there's going to be plenty of people myself probably included who carry on persevering in boxing as we always do <laughs> boxing's shot itself in a foot numerous times and continues to recover from it but it's just it just feels like now was a really good opportunity why did they have to do this now why couldn't they just get the rematch out of the way over and done with first um, and delivered there at least before doing this um, as you can tell I'm still frustrated yeah and it's something that we spoke about today when kind of the news broke and it was <laughs> it's very rare in boxing that news that big does get kept secret yeah. like it has done um, we obviously knew we were going to a press conference today but we didn't know what and we didn't know what was being announced obviously the initial thought was potentially while the Fury 2 yeah. had been announced didn't turn out that way it was literally the exact opposite now for people who are watching this who are kind of let's say less familiar with kind of the promotional landscape and the political minefield that is well, certainly boxing but heavyweight boxing explain to people 
<laughs> the the Good red work. tape that now is everywhere between Joshua Wilder and Tyson Fury. Well, ultimately, it all comes down to money, really. Everyone wanted to earn as much money from possible, and to do that, you have to do so at the expense of others. You have Fury in one corner, Wilder in another, Joshua in another. Frank Warren with Fury, um, Al Heyman with Deontay Wilder, Eddie Hearn with um, Joshua, all in separate uh, sides of the table again. Um, you've then got the British television, one's on Sky, one's on BT, etc. I wouldn't be surprised if we now see Wilder end up on ITV, given the whole mm -hmm. Al Heyman link. And then the US television, which now that uh, Fury's with Wilder, sorry, now Fury's, Fury's with ESPN, Wilder's with Showtime, just with his own, that's four significant obstacles to overcome mm. in any sort of fight getting made, any sort of agreement. When Fury didn't have a US television deal, which was the case, to our knowledge, 24 hours ago, there was nothing to stop this fight going on Showtime. Now he's got an, supposedly got an exclusive deal with Top Rank and ESPN. With ESPN. So unless there is something in the contract there, which means Fury can also fight on Showtime if that fight is also shown on ESPN, un unless Wilder does what would be a really unlikely move, I suspect, in agreeing to fight on ESPN instead of at Showtime. Because I don't believe he has it's the contract that, that Fury has. Sure, but I mean, uh, it's, it's, it's no secret that Bob Arum and Al Heyman yeah. are not the best of friends. I yeah, mean, that, I hadn't Bob, even mentioned that. Yeah. Another huge obstacle to overcome. There's red tape, politics everywhere. And just how can you realistically, realistically, particularly given all the egos and all the money involved, overcome all that and still get a fight signed and sealed? It's realistically not going to happen. Frank said today um, he was quite brazen in stating in the press conference that he and Tyson, in fairness, said that this now makes the Deontay Wilder fight more makeable. I don't necessarily believe yeah, that's true. Um, do you? No. Um, it might do on paper because you argue, well, it's all about money. We want to make more money. There's now more money on the table here. Deontay, if you don't have a contract with Showtime, why don't you just come and fight ESPN? We'll pay you even more money. So you could really simplify it like that. But it's not that simple um, again we don't know that Wilder doesn't have some sort of agreement to fight in Showtime and even then he would have to ditch what might have been some really positive relationships with him with Al Heyman or with Showtime etc does he want to do that and particularly but we haven't even discussed by the way there was a lot to admire about Wilder the two fighters going into that first fight had rematch clauses in the event of either winning or either losing I don't think that was the case with the draw. So there's actually very little to gain from Wilder. He must uh, his body language after that fight, the way he was talking after that fight, even though he claimed he thought he won, he knew he didn't win that fight. So there was very little to gain from him going in for this rematch as aggressively as he, as he has or as he's appeared to. Lots of more about that. So now that's all kind of been taken away as well. Just we had this really good rematch, this really good fight to look forward to. Well, we thought we were on the cusp of it, and now. Wilder it seems the fighter who really shouldn't want the fight of the two of them because again he has to be a huge underdog for that rematch is going to be the one who's going to have to make a leap for it to get for it to happen um, what we really need I suppose the last thing I want now I mean obviously I want more than anything in this context for that fight to be made for that rematch to be made but the last thing we need is this rumbling on and on and we're waiting for more opponents and people losing interest again we want Fury out in May Wilder ASAP after that if they're not going to fight each other soon so probably just need a WBC to call purse bids immediately so that it can be nipped in the bud one way or the other because if they're negotiating I suspect if if they are negotiating it's all about the pub, um, the PR aspect we, wanting to be seen to want the fight but wanting to make and I do believe all parties want the fight but they probably know there's too many obstacles to overcome it will be wanting to be seen to want the fight but not to be responsible for the mm. fight not taking place yeah no I agree with that um, you make an interesting case with, with regards to purse bids but we've also seen in the past Al Heyman fighters in the past vacate titles mm. uh, rather than fight on different networks or rather than take certain fights at certain times so even if purse bids were called by the WBC there's no guarantee that that fight will indeed take place next Anthony Joshua the, the Tyson Fury fight again I mean Fury was talking about that fight potentially happening or not happening today 
the fact that you've now got not only Frank Warren and Eddie Hearn, but you, as you say, mm. you've got ESPN Plus versus the Zone. That fight is also pushed further and further away. I suspect pop, pop, that rivalry is possibly even more intense than yeah. the one we see between Warren and Hearn, which we know a lot about as well, by the way. And mm. even possibly even more cutthroat. And it's also Deontay Wilder has. has the, it's no history. I mean, we've heard enough about it. This kind of Shelley Finkel, Eddie Hearn relationship, Al Heyman and Eddie mm. Hearn and Showtime and DeZone are, are hardly the best of friends. So it's really, it's as you say, I think you put it very well in the sense of boxing always kind of finds a way to shoot itself in the mm. foot with regards to promotional politics getting in the way of where we kind of were, which was on, on the verge of potentially all three of these guys fighting within the space of 12 to 18 months. And I think it's a real shame for the sport. Yeah, yeah, it is. This could have been like era defining, really. Um, I know it's been a long time since we had the truly defining uh, heavyweight champion that Lennox Lewis was. Everyone, for some reason, overlooks Klitschko, goes back to Lennox Lewis. But even then, at the very end of his career, that wasn't the interest in the heavyweight division wasn't quite what mm, it was no. because he had the Tyson fight, which a lot of people wanted to see, but everyone knew Tyson wasn't a fight he was in. You had to go back. You probably have to go back to the 90s mm. when Holyfield and Tyson were fighting for there to have been the interest. I believe there would have been in any sort of fights between Joshua, Wilder, Fury, etc. And also, and crucially, I believe these three fighters are at their collective peak. Joshua might have a bit more improvement to get. I don't think Fury's going to get any better. I think he'll be a lot better in the next time he fights, having had those 12 hard rounds mm. against Wilder. But I don't think there's much more to come from him in terms of ability and talent. Um, Wilder may will probably improve a lot off the back of that fight but I don't think he's going to get much better mm. and he's not particularly young so sooner or later he's going to start declining these fights are going to be at the best they're going to be right now and this opportunity is on the verge of getting missed and forever moving away from the heavyweights um, we were also greeted with the announcement today that Billy Joe Saunders will step up to 168 mm. pounds to um, challenge for the vacant WBO world super middleweight title um your thoughts on that? Again, another one that kind of crept up on people with Ramirez yeah, moving up. Um, I'm not sold on the prospect as soon as a super middleweight. No. no problem with the opponent whatsoever, by the way. He's had a layoff and I think I don't have any problem with him coming back. I mean, ideally a 10 round or something. A 12 round opponent who only lasts 10 rounds. I think Saunders make really light, easy work at this. The problem is that it's for a title that I don't believe this deserves to be for a world title. Um, the one hope for me is that Saunders, if Saunders does win the title, we see a rematch against Eubank Jr. if he beats De Gaulle or indeed maybe fights De Gaulle. But actually, I was never completely sold on the Saunders De Gaulle fight. As entertaining as I suspect that could be from a skill sense, because they're both talented fighters. Well, De Gaulle, not quite the fighter he was. Um, but as relevant as all that is the fact I believe Saunders is far more of a light middleweight than a super middleweight. A lot of the time he was campaigning at middleweight and looking very good but even then you're watching and thinking if you just be more disciplined and keep yourself alive you would be some light middleweight right now um he didn't look physically speaking that is entirely convincing as the middleweight so what's going well, i don't understand why he's gone up to super middleweight if that's not just a lack of discipline really there um i don't think it's a particularly lucrative division mm. outside of those two fights mm. i just mentioned from his perspective there are some good dangerous champions in there which isn't to say he can't beat them but i don't think he's going to earn the sort of money he might have been getting against alvarez maybe andrada golovkin, golovkin etc so um again no problems with the opponent on the night that we're talking about but the nature of the fight and where it's likely to lead is is certainly more questionable yeah i think it's quite a puzzling one i think the the consensus number one in the division callum smith again would throw up all of the the promotional mm. issues that we've just talked about callum smith being with eddie hearn sky sports and and the zone the other champions you've got caleb plant it's quite an uninspiring mm. fight or the, the opportunity to unify the division shouldn't be sniffed at but it's still it's not as you say the lucrative fights that that would lie for him at middleweight do you think potentially the fact that i mean eddie hearn and the zone seem to have kind of or DAZN in general seems to have kind of locked off the middleweight roster as it were you've got Canelo boxing mm. on DAZN you've got Danny Jacobs Demetrius Andrade do you think that might have been a factor in pushing him up to super middleweight I can certainly see that I can certainly see that the only one thing I would say in that is um, I don't think it's quite as problematic as the heavyweight division mm -hmm. uh, situation we've just been discussing they have it locked off yeah but largely from an American perspective mm. I think I, I don't think it would be as 
ruthless in the UK from a UK perspective someone who's a very much a British fighter mm-hmm. who doesn't have significant appeal in the US who if he's going to succeed he's going to uh, succeed on British television so I don't think that should be as difficult but yeah uh, I can certainly see how he would be encouraged to go for the super middleweight division to, to avoid the problems that could he could um, encounter there and again the other thing you can look at cynically perhaps is that if he goes up to super middleweight and doesn't lose then it's not necessarily in the world from a profile from a reputational perspective right just go back to middleweight you bit off more than you can chew if he loses to say someone like Andrada having had the past couple of years that he's had when which come off the back of him having that brilliant win against the moon by the way um, then that's a lot harder to come back from and you become a much harder sell for a fighter who didn't sell reams and reams of tickets wasn't probably wasn't getting the attention his talent deserves no I'm just having a look on box rack and I don't mean this in a disrespectful way but I, I've forgotten the name of the chap that Billy Joe Saunders is going to be fighting mm. so Shifat Isufi um, not somebody who I really ever heard mm. of um, you mentioned a good point at the start with you know if it's if it's going to be your second fight since the Lemieux fight then that's sort of a fine opponent to, to go on but I mean just one look at his, his box rack um undefeated since 2015 but the loss that he had was against Darius Sek who we've seen be stopped Mm. by Anthony Yard very recently seems a very very fortuitous opponent to be boxing for a world title I think he's probably putting it mildly yeah well I'd argue 2015 isn't necessarily that long in a boxing sense by the way you might not have had that many fights in that period anyway but I agree certainly fortuitous but actually that's uh, you know, to take this in a completely different direction, having been so critical of these sorts of things for the past 20 minutes or so, um, that's really good work from Frank Warren. If you can get your fighter a world title fight, having entered a new division, his first fight into that new division against what looks an opponent you can probably regard pretty lightly, then mm. you've done a really good work because if you win that title, then suddenly the picture changes significantly. Yeah, and as I say, just going to put this down. Um, I wasn't an attempt at belittling um, Billy Joe Saunders' opponent, but. It's, it's just not what we were kind of expecting. I mean, he was mandatory for Demetrius Andrade, which is mm. something I spoke to Billy Joe about earlier. You know, the, the opportunity to go back and write what he perceives as a wrong with being stripped to the WBO mm. um, for his VADA violation actually opens the door for Gennady Golovkin to fight for the WBO, which would then kind of lead you to believe that Gennady Golovkin potentially will lay his hat on the zone, which is you know, a great move for the zone yeah. as a platform and Andrade and potentially Eddie Hearn going forward. Yep, and would also make the Alvarez rematch even more likely. Um, would that be for all four titles now? Um, depends on, on the outcome well, yeah. of Alvarez um, versus Danny Jacobs. Yeah, yeah of course it is. So it would be for all four titles. Should, yeah. Uh, should yeah. Um, Jacobs. And look, that fight doesn't need all four, four titles to sell. Mm. Um, it would be, I mean, it's almost a sh- Jacobs fight is a very good one, by the way. It's almost a shame the Glovkin, uh, the trilogy fight with Glovkin isn't happening as soon as May. Uh, but no, that does seem increasingly likely now. That seems even more likely to happen as a consequence. And again, it's actually very rare that a, t- uh, a fighter has managed to unify all four world titles. So if that happens for either fighter before the end of the year, that is a huge achievement. And particularly from Golovkin's perspective, if you earn one last big payday and you can win that fight, that there is no better time to retire. Because Golovkin is declining now. Mm. Really, really good fighter still, by the way. will still beat most, but... He probably needs to have half an eye on something like that. Although, admittedly, I'd be jumping the gun here a fair bit too. Um, just final word on the kind of the WBO landscape shifting. Um, it was all put into posi- put into place rather by Gilberto Ramirez vacating mm. his WBO title. He's moved up to 175 pounds. He's now mandatory as per WBO regulations yeah. for uh, Sergei Kovalev's WBO title. Do you see Ramirez being a threat at 175 pounds? I'm not sold him at 175 pounds. He wasn't. I didn't think particularly life changing at 168 pounds to be honest and to go up and fight Kovalev in your first fight is a dangerous one as well particularly now that Kovalev has some momentum behind him again um, and it pu- puzzles me that as well because I'm not sure he earned that much more money at, mm. at light heavy than he was before maybe he was really struggling at the weight in a way that we weren't aware of um, but no to answer your question I don't see him I mean if it's not going to be Kovalev to dominate the coming year and I don't think it will be by the way I'd put I'd, be much more positive about maybe Marcus Brown or or Viterbi, you know, really good fighters. If there's one uh, fighter 168 pound is more likely to go up and make a real impact there, it's Callum Smith, I to agree. my mind. 
No, I agree with that. Um, with Ramirez moving up, taking the WBO mandatory slot, that also pushes Anthony Yard back mm. in the pecking order, who's somebody else that we saw today, um, was due to fight uh, this coming weekend mm. in Leicester. That fight's now not happening. What do you make of Anthony Yard? I mean, he's somebody who attracts a lot of criticism um, for a perceived lack of challenging or mm. meaningful opposition. Just your thoughts on him? Um, well, just going to take us back to... Part of uh, the start of part of it, I suppose, insofar as I believe people nowadays want too much too soon. We're talking about a fighter who I actually consider to be quite promising. His progress does appear to have stalled, um, but he has a lot of the attributes a fighter would need to actually become successful and a threat to the other fighters in the in his division. Um, we're also talking about him, I believe, being with the perfect promoter for him. Mm. Um, other promoters, for example, are good at bringing the best out of really marketable fighters. For example, fighters who might have some sort of social media or celebrity feel. I think Frank Warren is brilliant at guiding a career. Um, and okay, I can appreciate why some people think it has been a bit too cautious, but Warren tends to get those things right pretty consistently. Good judge um, of talent, yeah, Frank, historically. Very good judge of talent. When Yard first came onto the scene, you could see why he, why Warren was quite excited about him. Um, physically he's good technically again he appears to have stalled but if he needs time to become the fighter that he his trainer that Frank Warren hopes he can be then you give him that time um, I know it's been a while since he's fought but that's not necessarily just his fault he was in line to fight in the, the undercard of Wilder of Fury Wilder that Fury, fight yep. got cancelled I don't believe that, that was his making that it got cancelled mm. um, Yard Yard, Yard can become a good fighter. Um, needs to work on his feet a bit better, but physically he's very good. He just may, maybe needs a bit of time, and maybe after that time he doesn't become the fighter we hope he could be. But you don't risk it too soon. You don't put him in with a world level fighter, or indeed get him a loss at domestic level that he doesn't need because well, when he can still progress, when if you were holding back and put him in at the right time, he could actually have a decent career. I think, in a way, Gilberto Romero's moving up has kind of given Anthony Yard a little bit more breathing space to mm. get those kind of fights and get that experience under his belt. Um, just quickly pick up on what you've said there about a domestic fight. Jose Burton is, a, is another fighter who's been kind of calling for that fight. A lot of people want yeah. to see the Josh Boazzi, Anthony Boazzi's Yard the pick fight. The fights. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, you've just said it there. Just elaborate on that. The potential Joshua Boazzi versus Anthony Yard fight down the line would be huge, I think, if that, that fight could sell out the O2 quite comfortably. Yeah, definitely. Um, and, you know, if you made it at the right time, um, this makes me think of Frampton Quigg a little bit mm. because ha that should have been made a lot earlier on in their careers. Um, but I think both fighters, they particularly Quigg, improved so much that regardless of how the first fight went, you could have made a rematch, mm. sold a rematch, and said, well, it could, could be different this time around. Groves de Gale being a great yeah. example of that. If George Groves hadn't retired, if James de Gale was to beat Chris Eubank Jr., there would be no one who wouldn't want to see Groves um, fight de Gale again. This would be like that. I don't think Boazzi is a really talented fighter, possibly our best of that Rio 2016 crop, mm. him or Josh Kelly, has a really high ceiling. I don't think Yard's a guaranteed success that Boazzi is, but if you make that, if, if Boazzi isn't rushed in any way, shape or form, and Yard's progress speeds up a little bit yards career is handled correctly that'd be a really good fight and again if you if they both then go on their own paths again regardless of the out outcome of that fight fulfill their potential a fight the o2 between those two is actually be pretty special yeah that'd be huge um coming up next i'm going to be joined back in the studio by my old friend mr coogan cassius from ifl tv in association with mtk global as we go outside the box and discuss our roles in video journalism i guess you could call it take a look Welcome back to this week's episode of Outside the Box. I'm delighted to be joined once again by Mr. Coogan Cassius from IFL TV in association with MTK Global. <laughs> this week, um, as I said at the start of the show, we've developed a little friendship. Um, been good to get you down. You're somebody who I used to watch and used to listen to when I was not that many more than a fan now, but just a fan, if you want to put it that way, um, for a long, long time. Interesting you said used to. Now you're I don't have time to listen to anybody's... The only person, the only interviews that I listen to are Andy Pirouels. Because it's important that 
you know, I can give him tips and help and, and let him know where I think he's going right and wrong. Not, you know, but yeah, he's the only one. Occasionally I'll listen to some of your stuff. If you interview, let's for say, for example, Eddie Hearn on, I don't know, well, you can interview him anytime, but if there's something that I want to talk to him about and you've already spoke to him about it, I'll probably tend to have a look and see what you've asked him and what is kind of out there. But very rare, really, that I do watch anything now because I don't really have the time. The time I do have, I like to um, spend with my family, if possible. Who's your favourite person to interview? I don't really have a favourite one. I like people who talk. They're my favourite ones. Less of me talking, more of subject talking. Um... Just because, yeah, I kind of enjoy really listening to what they have to say as opposed to... Having to kind of force the Yeah, issue. look, let's not beat around the bush with it. There are some fighters out there that are very difficult to interview and it's of no fault of their own and they could be absolute killers in the ring. It makes no difference. It's just they don't like doing interviews. Um, the name that springs to mind is Mr. Daniel Dubois. Joe Joyce, another one? Joe Joyce. Joe Joyce is getting a little bit better. He is getting better, actually. I will say. Fair play to him. Daniel is like the silent assassin in terms of interviews. He's mm. like, says very little. Um, the odd soundbite you can get off, off Daniel, obviously, is no reflection of how he is on, in the ring. Uh, but just as a person to interview, yeah, I think, and it's not a secret, and it's not kind of slagging someone off because then they don't particularly want to talk for hours on end about pointless shit. Mm. But... Um, Does his talking in the ring, which is... Yeah, you know, but I really like point. Daniel, but I kind of like that side of him yeah. as well, even though it doesn't always help people like me and you. Um, you, you can kind of get him going if you, depending on the environment you're in, you're in and stuff, but... Daniel's one that I'd like to really, before I'm dead, like to get, <laughs> no, like to get a proper bit from at some point. It's it, it's quite good that there's people out there like that that you kind of work your way into getting more out of. And I think you have to kind of be mindful of that and respectful of that. A lot of people, like, not everybody's going to talk to you for 45 minutes like Dave Allen, who's going to talk to you about literally everything. Um, and you can't... One thing as well with, with, with whoever you interview, really, whether it be fighters or promoters, just like you would talk to a, two different people in the street differently or certain friends differently, you have to kind of tailor what you're doing to fit each person. You would never interview Daniel Dubois the way you interview Dave Allen. And I think you have to kind Absolutely of not. No. know that as you're doing it. Yeah. Um, but that's that's to do with really kind of knowing knowing the fighters and knowing a little bit about their yeah. personality of yeah how you kind of approach whichever interview. And it, it's the same with... Eddie Hearn and Frank Warren. I mean, mm. oh God, it's on a stick over like, you know, you don't ask Frank this and you don't ask this and you don't ask that and everyone's different. And would I have a conversation with Frank Warren about his favourite type of crisps? Probably not. If Frank wanted to talk about his favourite kind of crisps, would I entertain it? Absolutely. The next time I interview Frank, now I've said it, I'm going to ask him what his favourite crisps are. But Herm will sit there talking about pickled onion monster munch and whatever other bollocks for five minutes before we've even talked about a fight. But the interaction from them clips is like, great. I just think it's just like, it's not cutting edge journalism, I get that. But people kind of, tweeting me pictures of like Brannigan's roast beef and mustard every day going I found them it's just so what IFL is a bit trashy like that you know? <laughs> it is I'm not gonna lie it is a little bit like we could pretty much talk about anything you wanted and I think as long as you kind of balance it out with some actual boxing stuff I think you're all right. once in a while slip in a boxing question yeah absolutely in amongst all of the snack talk talking about access do you know what you were slagging me off for at the start of this video go back to that if you haven't seen that already that access that's something that 
has come about through kind of trust more so than anything else. Completely it's not agree. to do with me being particularly great at what I do because I'm average. You're very good, but carry on. Average. Cool. It's about kind of, yeah, a trust between me and it's more so pro promoter and broadcaster. Mm. My relationship with Frank, it, to back to when Frank was at Sky, when we first started, that's where it was. Then obviously the change to Box Nation and now obviously BT Sport. But my access consistently for like eight years um, has always been brilliant. And that's something I could never ever fault Frank for because ultimately it does kind of come down to, to Frank. And obviously if the Frank's happy, then the, the broadcaster usually cool. And the same with with Hearn and Sky, um, you know, get on well with Adam Smith and Barney Francis and obviously Eddie. So, and we've been doing it consistently for eight years. So it's not a case of I'm entitled to anything. And do I get away in certain situations with some stuff that other people can't get away with? Yeah, am I sorry for that? No, I can't be. It's mm. like, I've kind of have put myself in that position. Listen, I could have been a prick about this and, you know, I think there was one instance that, and I'll, I'll say it, that Sky weren't very happy with me because I filmed something that was a little bit close to while their, one of their pay-per-view show was going on. You know, and I had a few, a few conversations with people at Sky. It's never happened since, but they kind of addressed it. It was dealt with. They said, look, you can't do that while this is this situation is going on. And, mm. you know, um, yeah, I didn't weren't like a, a bollocking or anything like that. It was just they told me, you know, they said mm. to me, and I was like, fine. It's they call the shots. Believe it or not, I love watching boxing at home. I do. When when sometimes I get a chance to watch it, or me and my missus watch boxing uh, a, a boxing card at home, and I'm not at for for whatever reason, I love it. I love out just chilled watching it, rewinding shit, listening to. <laughs> some commentary <laughs> um, but just the whole thing I like I like watching it and I, to be honest with you most pay-per-view shows I'll buy anyway because I want to re-watch them on, on the day after so and to support the fighters yes that so in fact I, buy, I do buy all of them because I do want to watch them but yeah contributing my little 20 notes um, but yeah I mean the it's just because it's so relentless and there's like, when the fight weeks pick up from next week, every weekend now is gonna be banged out. It is relentless. And one of the things that kind of, obviously I've known who you are for a long time, but I don't know, I kind of got in my head like, like I work a lot of hours and I'm relentless and try and be on it as, as often as I can and borderline workaholic at times, I guess. But one of the things that kind of like, I loved about you in LA is you've been doing this for eight years and you do still work. You will wait around for hours to get an interview. But people, I don't think people quite understand the waiting time and how long it actually takes to do things, like to actually get an interview and then go to another hotel and go to this and go to that. Sort of going off the topic a little bit here, but like all people see is kind of like the, the end, sometimes five minutes, sometimes 55 minutes. But it's not easy gathering content, particularly away from home. And that kind of end of April to early June time is is going to get me in a lot of trouble um, if I go to all of those shows. Do you know what? I think that, again, there'll be some people watching this thinking, oh, look at them moaning about this. It's, it's not, not that at all. It's like, not a moan. It's just, it's not a moan at all. I would all. not trade my job in for anything in the world, for sure. But it no. doesn't mean that it's not difficult. No, unless you're doing it. And I, I, I kind of get that with the guys I've got with me at the moment, like um, Umar and Andy and, and Wingy. Uh, until they've kind of done a fight week, they don't really... Uh, and they've all said to me, I didn't really know, because Umar and Andy done the... Belfast show. The Belfast yeah. show, which I was on a family holiday and something that I wasn't ever going to miss for... King Kong against you. Well, actually, if King Kong was fighting you, I probably would have been there for that. No, but I wasn't, that was, I was already committed into that. And then it was then announced that like 
Brampton, Windsor Park, blah, 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 blah. Then the whole Fury thing, the Wilder thing, Billy Joe mm. Saul is there. I mean, it's just literally like an IFL wank week. It was, right? yeah. So, but they did it. You know what? And it was like, and but they kind of realised what it was that week. And it's hard to explain to someone unless you do it. Like, you, you cover like a full fight week. Like, aside from the fight night, you've got four other days to cover. So you've got a five-day week. And um, again, it's not a moan. It's just, you just have to do it to know what it entails. I think in this game, this video world. Yeah, not it, video but, journalism. No, let's just call it the online the, boxing world. Yeah. I think hard work will probably be natural talent in this. In terms of how far are you willing to go? What are you willing to do? Are you prepared to do this for four years and not earn any money? Which is exactly what we did. Are you prepared to do this for four years? Ask yourself that. Like, that's why a lot of the boxing channels that come on now, and I know the way it works, because we've been there. Start a boxing channel. Turn up to big press conferences. You may get, you may nab the, the big interview. Do that five days a week. Do it for four years with no profit. It's not even no profit, it costs you money. It ends up costing yeah. you. Do you know how many trips I went to? They're Mayweather trips I'm talking about. We didn't have a budget. We didn't have any money coming in. I paid for them Mayweather trips. That's why I was going on my own as well to a lot of them. The Mayweather trips and I went to loads of American trips. Went to like Purdy Alexander, <laughs> Reese Broner. I paid for them myself. So you are, you're right. You're not, it's not even, you're not even breaking even. And listen, Hearn, Matram, Frank, they've been great kind of supporting that over the years, which hats off to them for that because they don't have to do that. They've don't helped. Do they do it for us. But what I'm saying is, <laughs> it's like someone saying to you, Rob, right, go and do a day's work here. But don't worry, we'll 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 give you your train fare there, and we'll get you your lunch. So you might physically not be out of pocket, which is great. At that point, I was like, I'll be happy just not to be out of pocket. But you're physically not going there to actually earn any money. So that was like 2010 to 2014, nothing. Now, it might not sound like anything to anyone, but. Go and do your job and... No, but that's what you've got to apply it to. You've got to apply it to any walk of life. Would you commit yourself or do you commit yourself? I don't know if people do it. I'm not saying they don't do it. I'm saying you've got to go and do this. It's all very well. Listen, I love boxing. You love boxing. But your love of boxing doesn't pay your water bill. Mm. It's true. I'll be honest with you. We didn't know about YouTube revenue for the first two and a half years. Right, nothing from YouTube was... We didn't even know that was a thing, doing it at first. And then... I think... Early checks from YouTube, when the, the views... I mean, people think you you are millions of YouTube. It, it doesn't work like that, people. <laughs> it, it really doesn't. Like, you know, they, they go, oh, look at that KSI. You know, KSI has got, like... I mean, a ridiculous amount of followers and uh, All subscribers of and things. Well, yeah. yeah, so it's, 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 it's a different. It's a different league. So never com stratosphere. compare like KSI numbers to anything in boxing because <laughs> it doesn't apply. But yeah, it, it, to do that for that long. But the whole point of it is not quitting on that. That's where I kind of give myself a little. Yeah, yeah, no. For not stopping, and then listen. I'm not saying. I just think it's a difficult thing to make money from now. Especially now, you kind of got, you, listen, your channel's done very well in a short space of time to kind of get to where you've got. I mean, let me tell you, how long have you been going? Boxing Social? Yeah. Two years? Two years. I've been here since May. Our first two years, we didn't even have 7,000 subscribers on our channel. Do you know what I mean? Mm. That's why when you look at that and look at how oversaturated the market is now mm. and look at that and think, I'm telling you now, I was looking at the subscribers thinking, are they ever going to go up? Mm. 
like literally, I think after two years, we was on roughly about seven, maybe 8,000. So <laughs> it's like, it took us a year to get to a million. I remember it took us like 13 months to hit a million views on the channel. And it was like, I thought I cracked it. I've still got a hit list of people that I'm struggling to nail down. It's nothing boxing related. But who well. have you not interviewed? No, oh, so, so this is in general. No, I suppose boxing wise, I'd like, I'd like to do something longer with Mayweather. I think my interviews with Mayweather, I've done about three over the, the years and they've, they've not been that long. So I'd, that's what something I would like to do with Floyd, only because I haven't done it. Many other people have, I haven't. Manny Pacquiao is another one that I would love to interview, never interviewed Pacquiao. Um, and then Dave Allen, obviously. But he's, you've interviewed him. I know, but. He's still on the list. Still on the list. Um, but boxing wise, would I love to interview Al Heyman? Yeah, Absolutely. that's that's the holy grail. Which is not Heyman. impossible. Well, it's not going to happen. The but last I'm just saying, I'm just saying, would I, would I, was 1996, I think. Right. I've, I've thought about it. So yeah, Al Heyman. Have you done anything with Mike Tyson? Again, a very short, weird interview I did with him many years ago. Many, like about seven years ago. But yeah, he's another one I'd probably want to sit down with yeah. and do like a long... Yes, absolutely. Um... But then my other ones are kind of, yeah, like football and... Who football? I'd love to interview Thierry Henry. Okay. And I'd love to interview Ian Wright. I'm, I'm backtracking a little bit here okay. to a point that we were talking about that I didn't... I wanted to go on, but we changed subjects. Okay. So when I said that, like, from four years on, is this boring really you already? No, I'm just tired. I have a child, unlike you. It keeps me up all night. But continue. I might have a... I don't. You might have one. You don't know. I definitely don't. <laughs> um, for four years, um, when we got involved with MTK, who were MGM back then, like I've, I've, I think I've said this out before, but... Without that relationship starting in 2014, like I would not be doing what I'm doing now. 100% not. Because they came in at a time where I genuinely was thinking, as good as this is, I can't afford to do this. I mm. can't afford to like, do you know what I mean? Run up and down the country and like not earn any money. Just it's not, four years is like long enough to be doing that and nothing's happened so is it really a thing mm. so their kind of early input into IFL was absolutely crucial I w would go as far as saying if that hadn't come out it's all very well saying oh something else would have come you don't know that mm. so their kind of yeah their involvement and their influence and their our association with them has just been a, a blessing in disguise and it's like the best move that ever happened to IFL was that because it, 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 I said I'll safely say that I don't I was literally ready like two months ago I remember who I was talking to I was actually talking to Anthony Joshua about it name drop yeah but this is before before he, before he before he was a unified champion he weren't even British champion at the time Oh, where is nobody there? Just an I think he did about Carol. four fights. <laughs> but he was like, what? I was like, yeah. I was like, he went, something will come up. What? And when people tell you something's going to come up, all right. When? What? <laughs> tell me. Don't tell me something's going to come up. How did the MTK thing, or MGM as it was back then? MGM. So, um... Matthew Macklin spoke to Matthew Macklin and his brother Seamus um, and said to us to come out to Marbella at the time went out there uh, yeah sat down with Matt and they had a kind of look around the gym and stuff and told us and that they'd, they'd only been going a year or so then kind of plans for moving forward 
uh, and yeah, Matt was just like, I want to kind of get involved in what you're doing and stuff. And so yeah, we kind of spent a couple of days out there, and yeah, they Matt offered us a sponsorship, which was great. And then yeah, but it's just become kind of more involved over the years. We've gone on, obviously now, kind of um, Sandra Vaughan is. Uh, head of MTK so work a lot with Sandra and obviously the team and the amount of boxers they've got is incredible I wouldn't start again now and do it I'd do something else I'd go into darts what reporting on darts yeah or like just it, playing darts yeah <laughs> either no but if I had to start again now I wouldn't I wouldn't start the whole YouTube thing again that's why I think what you've done or like everyone at Boxing Social have done in a short space of time is quite good in terms of kind of getting yourself out there, getting your name out there and because it's so easy to fall behind because you haven't got any financial backing to kind of sustain it. And you know, look, people say what they want about Ellie Secback. Ellie Secback's kind of the original person to do it in in boxing, and he's done other sports. I think he didn't even really start, for, yeah, basketball yeah. and whatever else. But there ain't no one more hardworking in this thing we do. And like I said, he he may not be everyone's cup of tea. I will get on all right with him. Ellie I've only met him twice. One of which was in LA. But you see what Ellie Ellie does. He's like, I, I dread to think when Ellie sleeps, he's uploading a video every five minutes. <laughs> he's in, constantly interviewing someone, and like, I just think, where's your life, Ellie? Like, <laughs> where is your life? But fair play to him because he was kind of, you know. And look, I'm not a hater of like, and I know you're not either. It's like everyone's doing their thing, and we are in kind of. I look at it as friendly competition. I don't look at it like. I don't want you to do well. I want. Do I want more numbers on my videos? Absolutely. Of course, yeah. Of do course. you want more numbers on your videos? Absolutely. Do I want you to kind of not do well? No, absolutely not. Do I want you not to earn money and kind of cover the sport that you love? No, absolutely not. But I think people will kind of look at competition as a. It's a kind of a fuck you attitude, mm. like, and I'll get on with to a certain degree with with everyone whether they get on with me I don't know <laughs> but you know everyone's got their opinions about everyone and I res- like I said everyone who's kind of turned their their thing into a business that's the thing because you've got to turn it into some sort of business if you don't you're doing it out of the love of sport which is fine but accept it it's that um I think the fact that you're on here kind of shows that, doesn't oh. it? I mean, if you were territorial in any way, you wouldn't be on... Listen, I've told you before, again, I'm not going to mention names. I've had other channels write emails and shit about me, complaining about the access I get. Mm-hmm. I mean, shit like that. I just think, why? why? Like, I've never brought it up as in to them because I just find it irrelevant but I've had other YouTube companies message people at, at different companies within boxing complaining about why why am I given certain access and they're not and I'm fucking know it was you Tebba <laughs> <laughs> it definitely wasn't Tebba no but wasn't me. okay well well this has been Rob Tebba for our boxing social and uh that's not how No, I hold talk. on, let me do it. Hello, this is Rob Tebbett from Boxing Social. I'm delighted to be joined by Chris Banks Senior. Hello, <laughs> old chap. That is a little bit more you, isn't it? The Coogan Cassius Swineville TV, MTK Global. <coughs> Rob Tebbett, Boxing Social. <laughs> delighted to be joined. This could go on for a while. So um, it's a not, it's been really good to have you on. I do, I, 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 I'm very grateful. Um, you didn't have to do this at all. Um, you know so I do appreciate your time you are somebody who I have an immense amount of respect for and look up to um because I'm the fucking man Tebbert you were 
<laughs> so um, Te- yeah. I'll, I'll go on record and say Teba is like on a different level to interviewing than me. You are. You're very good at. I, I, do you know what? Funny enough, I phoned Teb when I was absolutely pissed <laughs> <laughs> and said the same thing to him. So I think I'll say this to him while I think Teb is like, yeah, you, you. I might be better at manoeuvring myself into certain situations only because, like, I'm privileged with access apparently and shouldn't be. <laughs> but Teb interviewing is fucking on point. Yeah, man. Thanks very much. It is far better than me. I mean, I'm borderline blagger, aren't I? Like, just, just there, aren't I? Someone said to me, I was like, I'm just a man with a camera. I call myself a prick with a camera. I thought that's a bit harsh. But I'm just a man with a camera with the ability to say words and remember certain things at the same time. That's it. But you, what you do, an actual skill, you actually ask questions. <laughs> Not talk about crisps. Okay, well, we're trying to wrap it up again for the 15th time. Coogan Cassius, IFL TV, MTK Global. Thanks very much for coming on the Boxing Social podcast. Um, I'll see you very, very soon, as always. So that was Outside the Box with myself and Coogan Cassius from IFL TV in association with MTK Global. Um, Declan, hopefully that wasn't um, too self-indulgent for your tastes. Um, you're somebody who you have experience on kind of both sides of the fence, as it were, online, print, mm. um, one of the most knowledgeable print guys around. Um, don't make that face, it's a nice compliment. Uh, where do you kind of stand on the, the recent influx, really, of, of kind of online? I mean, you're somebody who's been doing this job for an awful long time before certainly the online boom, as it were. Mm. Just your thoughts on the whole online versus print or online situation. I don't think it's any coincidence um, that boxing's popularity has been enhanced as much as it has in recent years at the same time as that boom you mentioned took place. Um, I think the likes of Coogan yourself mean that there's content, I hate that word, but content (laughs) going out to viewers who otherwise wouldn't be looking at newspapers. Um, making them more I actually have a very good friend um, who is almost more of a fan of online boxing interviews than he is of boxing himself he got into the boxing in- interview scene before he actually got into boxing and now he's fascinated every time I see him all he wants to do is talk about boxing because of the back of that it's done wonders for the popularity and of course that has been good for the print media anyway because the more popular boxing is the more relevant it is to newspapers the more space it's likely to get in newspapers so um, it has its challenges certainly um, but those challenges I'm referring to um, conflicts of interest etc they existed before then anyway maybe it's complicated things but I don't it's certainly not a bad thing for boxing whatsoever there has been no sport I don't think that has benefited more from the social media age than boxing because boxing saw an opportunity probably a bit I just saw an opportunity that's probably a bit two kinds of boxing I think it happened quite chaotically but at some point through social media and platforms like yourself provide those involved in boxing saw an opportunity to start pushing themselves start selling themselves where those opportunities were getting fewer and fewer within newspapers you go back to the 1990s you know a British title fight would be getting a fair bit of space in the paper they hardly get any nowadays even some world title fights barely get any attention so great for boxing but actually again the fact that boxing is getting more popular is good for newspapers as well for as long as newspapers are around at least that's something that i've spoken to you about um <clears throat> various different times really but i mean one that sticks out in the mind is uh, wilder fury in la mm. when i'm kind of running around grabbing content um sorry to use the word and and kind of interviewing everybody and anybody who's kind of around it's not like that for you print guys i mean i know you're a huge boxing fan and there are plenty of people out there who you would would love to sit down Mm. with and do 20 25 minutes but that doesn't kind of work with your job role explain that for me well basically and like you say it's a shame because you can you walk into these media rooms and you get these great names there who would make great interviews i remember walking past nazine richardson Mm. i'm thinking I'd love to sit down and do 20 minutes with him, but you have to put yourself in a pers- um, think of a perspective of those who are reading the British newspapers who won't know who Nazim Richardson is. Um, and again, when you're doing something online, in theory, you have unlimited space. You can do as much as you want and it all goes up there. 
if you only have half a page or a page to fill and why would you bother speak what wasting someone's time if it's not going to go anywhere these are and it needs to be newsy you can't mm. there's a different um different audience they want to know what's ha- the audience of reading newspaper want to know what's happening that week around that fight they don't really care about what's going on with this trainer and his promising fighters um yeah, so it, it comes down to a space thing a lot of the time. No matter how much you might want to talk to someone, it's not really worthwhile. And for those who are interested in watching an Azim Richardson interview, I did 50 minutes with him. Um, sorry about that, Deck. But anyway, moving on. Uh, James DeGale versus Chris mm. Eubank Jr. coming up this weekend. Um, the first half of this podcast is predominantly about that. Um, you're somebody who has been around um, and, and seen kind of the build up to the fight over the past few days when we've had the um, the media workouts. Mm. Just your thoughts on the fight. Um, well, I don't think anyone can talk about this fight with any sort of conviction mm. because we cannot be sure how much James DeGale has got left as a fighter. If you look at the Truex fights, you'd probably be quite negative about that. Um, similarly, Eubank Jr., while you might give him the physical advantages because you might think DeGale's cl- declined a lot, he's not a natural super middleweight. Um, there's also he's a touch enigmatic himself as a fighter and he's now working with a trainer who we don't know enough about so we've got no idea even if we did know a lot about his, his trainer we wouldn't necessarily know that they're going to gel and become this brilliant success Eubank Jr. may have gone may need to go backwards with a new trainer before he goes forwards again so there's so many elements of the unknown going in this fight which make it really fascinating I've seen them both in the flesh I think they both look good physically although again Eubank Jr. looks a middleweight the girl by his standards I'd argue looks superior physically than I'm used to him looking but there's always a concern with James that particularly when we were looking at his fight in early December that now it's been put back and put back albeit not officially um, now it's taking place towards the end of February is there a chance he may have overtrained for this fight he, you could argue he looked like a fighter who'd overtrained for the Truex fights what I do believe is that he's comfortably the superior technician um I'd have, I'd have said that before Eubank lost to Groves as he did and I also believe strongly even if the girl's not been a great fighter he's certainly been a very good fighter you could argue has had a great career particularly the way he's traveled and fighters of that caliber are quite often capable of turning back the clock at least once I think I'd be very surprised well not very surprised but I'd be slightly surprised if he does, doesn't have enough left physically to perform as he, uh, as he will need to on the night to at least get a narrow win even if he's depleted because not least because I think he's very motivated for this now you make an interesting point there particularly about uh, Chris Eubank Jr. working with a new trainer mm. I spoke to George Groves about this a few days ago and hopefully George doesn't mind me, me airing this because this wasn't in the interview but the old version of Chris Eubank Jr. the, the kind of go forward and let your hands go, I think might be more suited to this fight yeah, than, than potentially making changes. When Nate Vasquez comes out of the Mayweather gym, the Mayweather yeah. gym is very much jab and, and counter-punching, moving your feet. I mean, Eubank Jr. historically hasn't had the best feet going, mm. but I'm not sure, I, regardless of how much Chris Eubank Jr. can improve for this fight, he's still not going to be the superior technician. So what I'm my kind of thought process is, the old Eubank Jr. I think would have a more... I mean, admittedly, we're, we're kind of basing this on a on something we've not seen yet in Eubank Jr., but kind of that, that aggressive come-forward style. We saw Caleb Truax in two fights really get to James mm. Gale by not doing anything spectacular. It, w- it was very much come-forward and James was going back in straight lines. Do you think that version of, uh, that version of Chris Eubank Jr., if he was to show up against that version of James Gale, could win the fight? Well, um, first thing first... Truax is a natural super middleweight but I know exactly what, I understand exactly what you're getting at and the answer is yes if that version of Eubank Jr the one who you know, got his ears boxed off against Groves but was still physically quite impressive that night mm. took his licks yeah took, Groves a big puncher yes, so much yeah. bigger puncher underrated than, than, puncher yes yeah. much uh, bigger puncher than even DeGale uh, a peak version of DeGale certainly um, and he he looked like he could have done that for another t- another 10 rounds another 12 rounds and there's a lot of heart in Eubank Jr and I think his self-belief I mean, it comes across as ignorance sometimes, but that's a strength. He's a very confident fighter. I don't, I don't think he's ever walked to a ring thinking he's going to lose. When there was that talk of him fighting Golovkin, which was a long, which was when Kel Brook ended up fighting him, Golovkin was at his most dangerous. Eubank Jr. wasn't anywhere near ready for a fight like that. I firmly believe then he would have walked to the ring that night thinking he was going to win. 
But again, I know exactly what you're getting at. If the gale has declined, as it the Truex fights at least suggest he had, um, Eubank Jr. needs to start very fast. Just put it on him immediately. Because if he builds a lead, then I think the gale could find it very difficult to come from behind and um, and win. And I don't think he ends up stopping Eubank Jr. So. What do you make of the new trainer? Um, I mean, obviously we're yet to see his, his kind of methods put into mm. practice, but... I think it's an understatement to say that that's an easy stable to go into or an easy environment to go mm, into when certainly. you've got the likes of Chris Eubank Sr. We've seen Adam Booth come and go in the past, um, somebody who obviously doesn't take any shit. How is that going to work on fight now? You've already got Ronnie Davis in there. Yeah. You've got Chris Eubank Sr. who I'm assuming is going to be, he refused to comment on whether or not he would be in the corner. And now you've got a new trainer who, by Eubank Sr.'s own admission, it was something we heard from him earlier in, in the podcast that, unless you've boxed to a level that he deems a champion's level as it were he's not really one to listen to an opinion I think is probably fair to say how's that dynamic if at all ever going to work well, in the corner on fight night that's even before you said that I did say I wouldn't be surprised if he just doesn't listen on fight night um, which again every now and again with a fighter can be a strength um, but it would seem strange not to do so for a fight in which you've drafted someone in because you realise how bad you previously looked by bad it, certainly in the context of Eubank's potential um, and you touched on something else there which I thought was interesting which was Eubank Senior not refusing to say whether he'd be in the corner or not if you read between the lines there it's not been a happy camp mm. at least from everyone's perspective maybe Eubank Junior's perfectly happy maybe the new trainer's perfectly happy I don't get the impression everyone is convinced by the dynamic there that they thought the new trainer was necessarily the right, the right move to go in. Um, and for that reason, by the way, when you say about you know the Mayweather element, etc., I understand exactly why you would say that, but I'm not sure Eubank Jr. will actually end up trying to be that sort of fighter. Mm. And I think it's too far gone with him and he should just become the best version of himself that he's now capable of being, which is hopefully still him with improved feet, mm. thinking a bit more, having... You know, set of eyes on him in training that makes sure his sparring is as, as it could be, for example, um, as opposed to trying to completely overhaul him. And if he has tried to overhaul him, and I would like to think he hasn't, if he's tried to overhaul him ahead of, ahead of, ahead of a fight like this, similar to what we were saying about Hatton and Pacquiao, um, Hatton's mm, performance mm. against Pacquiao, he could be completely exposed on a night. If he, if he decides he needs to completely overhaul him, he needs to make it a gradual process. He doesn't need to do it for this fight, certainly. Yeah, and I think going back to what you said about Eubank Jr.'s ignorance, which not necessarily a negative when you're talking about a fighter. No, usually a strength. Certainly. Yeah, I think the the nature of Eubank Jr.'s makeup, if he is boxing for two or three rounds under this kind of new style and it's not working, I don't see him being the, the type of fighter to keep persisting with something no. that he believes is not going to work. And I think he will revert to type. Yes, certainly. And actually, I think he'd be right to as well because... Um, the girl's at his best when he gets into a rhythm. If the girl wins the first few rounds, gets some confidence. I know he has a really bad habit of switching off, mm. and that could actually make it interesting itself. Because if that was to happen at the same time, for example, that Eubank Jr. suddenly decides to revert to type, then completely changes the fight. But um, yeah, if if you're losing, I mean, take all fighters, all individual involved in this um, out of the equation anyway. If you're losing, you do need to do something differently. But I am convinced, as by the sounds you are, um, if you if things aren't going as Eubank Junior wants, and he's been told to do something to instructions, he'll stop doing things to instructions, and he'll probably end up doing what he normally does. Um, just lastly, before we wrap up, we've we've brought his name up intermittently throughout this. George Groves announced mm. his retirement from the sport. Um, George is somebody I know that you covered a awful yeah. lot throughout his career. Terrific career, brilliant career. Um, I'd argue probably just didn't have the defining win I thought he was capable. I rem really remember when he came on the scene and just being convinced we have a real talent on our hands here. Um, around the time he was fighting Kenny Anderson, uh, for mm. example, really good fight. And I know he made hard work of that, but that's often part of the learning curve for a fighter. Mm. And you just think if he got that first Froch fight, if that had gone as Groves hoped it was going to, as it was threatening to go, I still think he was on the verge of getting stopped in that fight, even had the ref not intervened as he did then he would have had that real, real defining victory. But that that he didn't have that, that he had those setbacks, um, that he had so many obstacles overcome. And by the way, that he did it also independently, which mm. is really admirable and really unusual nowadays. Just actually becoming the story of Grove's career, like that independence, that persistence to keep going when he'd had so many setbacks to eventually succeed as he did. 
and yeah you just you hope he seemed a very satisfied man mm. and not in a remotely smug way I mean that in, in the kindest possible way just seemed content to be retiring you just hope he doesn't get tempted back I th- and he didn't come across like a fighter who will be tempted back um, earned all the success he, he got and I suspect was ushered towards retirement by some of the things he experienced in his the yeah, other, good neck fight. yeah um, he had a tough career Groves and probably doesn't get enough credit mm. sadly because yeah, he was really entertaining my sort of fighter who you know and what I mean by that is his fights were generally quite clean they rarely became too scrappy always had that right hand cocked fought with a lot of spite mm. with power backed himself he got hurt quite a few times and hurt by fighters who sometimes were below the level you thought he was mm. but he never fought with any f- sort of fear he was never we were talking about Eubank, Eubank Jr. a minute ago Groves is an ignorant fighter but that was one of his strengths one of the things that made him so entertaining um, yeah great career surprised he called it a day before De Gale versus Eubank Jr. initially yes but once you spoke to him you kind of thought no because I mean when it was first announced you, it, you know a cynic might look at that and think he's back in De Gale to win um, he wants to be retired so they have to make him a bigger offer to come out of retirement for that rematch but um, there was I, th- I did wonder after the Smith defeat if we were nearing the end because, again, Groves was a really brave fighter, really ignorant at times. Um, even after that really heavy frotch stoppage the second time round, I remember him trying to get back yeah. onto his feet, which mm. how that was even capable is remarkable. Um, how he was even capable of that is remarkable. Against Smith, and he was right to do so, by the way, and that's probably experience, but I don't think it was just down to experience. I think it was due to the hunger being gone mm. a little bit. He was hurt, and the Groves that fought Carl Frotch would have carried on mm. fighting. He would have got back up, and he would be—he would have been even more hurt as a consequence. So again, it's a good thing he didn't. But the fact he didn't try and carry on made me think that's not very George Groves like. Mm. I wonder if the end is near. And so yeah, when you put it in that context, it's probably not that big a surprise. Well, I echo those thoughts. I think that's very well said. Uh, brings us to a natural conclusion to episode three of the Boxing Social podcast. Um, Declan Warrington, thanks very much for popping down to the yeah. studio today. Hope to have you back again soon. Um, just a reminder that everything that we've done today, the full versions will be available on our YouTube and Facebook platforms, as well as on iTunes and SoundCloud. Just want to thank all of our guests for appearing on the show, particularly Coogan Cassius from IFL TV in association with MTK Global. Thanks very much, Declan Warrington. I've been your host, Rob Tebbett. Thanks very much for tuning in to the Boxing Social Podcast.